this is an unusual hearing because we're combining two subcommittees, and I think that says a great deal about the importance of this hearing today. So I want to welcome all of, all of our guests and all of you to a topic that has an effect on the daily lives of all Americans. Yet, as it turns out, few think about this subject. Freight transportation. Goods appear <laughs> magically. Nobody wants to think about how they got there and what it takes. I want to thank uh, Chairman Lipinski, my counterpart on the Railroad Subcommittee, uh, for joining with me to hold this joint <clears throat> hearing. Facilitating commerce and goods movement is a fundamental role of what the federal government is supposed to do. And it is one of the essential responsibilities of this committee. Remember, we are preparing for surface transportation reauthorization in 2020. This hearing will help the committee understand the improvements that Congress can help, can help make to facilitate uh, and ensure uh, infrastructure is able to handle freight transportation needs, and those needs are growing very rapidly. Uh, they are not only growing, they are changing. Uh, the well-established supply chains are now being challenged and reimagined as the rise of e-commerce. We didn't even talk about e-commerce four years ago when we approved, when, 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 when the last transportation bill was passed. Since then, we've had the rise of e-commerce, and that has forced a fundamental shift. Consumers now expect that anything can be delivered to their doorstep in a few days, sometimes a few hours. This amazing leap in only the four years since we had our last uh, reauthorization comes at a cost. Without appropriate planning for last mile infrastructure, we run the risk of not only congestion, which is clearly a major problem that we have discussed in this committee, but total gridlock in urban areas where 80% of the American people now live. We will also hear testimony that freight is, is a significant and growing source of greenhouse gas emissions. The freight sector will emit 535 million metric tons of carbon dioxide emissions in just one year, 2020, a figure that is expected to grow annually unless we take some very serious steps to reverse that trend. I am committed to looking at a range of solutions under the purview of this committee to move trucking towards zero emissions. It is already too late. That is not a, a goal that is too steep to make. We will also hear on a topic that I've long championed, strong support for intermodal and multimodal investments. Uh, we understand while federal programs are currently stovepiped uh, since the beginning of this committee, uh, and that's because of the unique funding streams for different modes. But we certainly can do more to provide flexible ways for our state and local partners to invest in their most pressing freight supply chain needs, regardless of mode, and to support seamless transitions between modes. That nothing could be more important than not losing time going from one mode of transportation to another. In the last surface transportation bill, Congress laid the foundation for policies and resources to address 
the needs of our freight network. Today, as needs are rapidly evolving, we must not be constrained by the transportation network we have. This is the transportation network we have had since the very beginning. But rather, we have to explore and evaluate policies that will develop the network we need for the future. This hearing is the first step to support the committee in doing that work. Again, I thank our witnesses, and I'm pleased to ask Mr. Dave, excuse me, uh, I, first I ask unanimous consent that the chair be authorized to declare recesses during today's hearing without objection so, so ordered. I also ask unanimous <coughs> consent that members not on the subcommittee be permitted to sit with the subcommittee at today's hearing and ask questions without, uh, with, without objection. I, 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 will, uh, I, I will proceed now to ask our ranking member, Mr. Davis, for his opening statement. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and I'd also like to thank uh, Chairman DeFazio, uh, Chair Le Chairman Lipinski, and also our ranking member of the Rail Committee, uh, Mr. Crawford, for having this joint hearing today. And it's a great opportunity to uh, welcome all of our witnesses, too. I look forward to hearing your testimony. Uh, one of the key factors to America's economic competitiveness is the ability to effectively transport goods and products from where they are made from where they're harvested, from where they're produced or processed, and eventually to where they're sold and consumed. The strength of our freight system and, and my home state of Illinois' position as the nation's premier freight hub relies upon a, dep a dependable system of highways, roads, bridges, rail tracks, and uh, open skies. This is important because nearly every load of freight will be transported on a truck at some point in the journey too. Over the next coming decades, demand for freight moved by truck is expected to increase significantly. Coupled with the dynamic nature of supply chains and changing consumer demands, we must focus on not only improving existing infrastructure, but also planning for a system that will take us into the future. I look forward to hearing from each of you uh, about how Congress can improve freight programs and increase efficiency and productivity for our freight transportation system. And Madam Chair, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Davis, for your opening statement. Remember I said this was a joint hearing, is a joint hearing, with the Subcommittee on Railroads, Pipeline, and Hazardous Materials. I now call on the chair of that subcommittee, Mr. Lipinski, for an opening statement. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Norton. The, uh, as we work now on uh, the Surface Transportation Reauthorization Bill, I always go back and think that Oftentimes, people refer to this as the highway bill, sometimes the highway and transit bill. Uh, but it's important to recognize that in the FAST Act, we clearly made it highway, transit, and rail. And so I think uh, it's important that, uh, and very fitting that the rail subcommittee is included in, in this hearing. And I expect that uh, this reauthorization that we're working on right now will not only include Amtrak reauthorization and other passenger rail provisions, but also a robust investment in freight rail infrastructure. I'm a strong proponent of this investment because it will make freight movement faster and more efficient. And this investment would have far-reaching positive impacts by increasing jobs, many of them good-paying union jobs, making businesses more competitive, and decreasing greenhouse gas emissions. I represent part of Chicagoland, which is the freight rail hub of North America. Six class one railroads intersect in the region. About 25% of all freight trains and 50% of intermodal trains pass, in the nation pass through. The congestion uh, in this region and its impact on freight movement in our country is well known. In addition, Will County, just south of Chicago and partially included in my district, is the largest inland port in North America with major intermodal facilities, which cause significant congestion and safety issues on Interstate 80 and surrounding roads. This year, the state of Illinois committed to raising the revenue needed to invest in a nationally critical I-80 corridor. It's time for the federal government to step up on this project and other, others like it across the country. And this reauthorization is the time to do it. 
As Ms. Ailman mentions in her testimony, the CREATE Rail Modernization Program in Chicagoland, which has been ongoing for about 15 years, is a unique $4.6 billion public-private partnership designed to address the freight and passenger rail congestion and to ease congestion on roads crossing rail lines. Through the years, CREATE has been funded through federal, state, local, and private sources. I've long been a champion of this program since I was able to earmark money to it as one of the 25 projects of national and regional significance in Safety Lou. This is how mega projects were, were funded in Safety Lou, and I have no problem talking about earmarks. Uh, the FAST Act fund for mega projects comes through Infrastructure for Rebuilding America, or INFRA grants, which are specifically for freight movement projects. INFRA grants have a $500 million aggregate cap for port, rail, and intermodal projects. This was a hard-fought compromise as the original proposal would have excluded multimodal projects altogether. This would have been a major mistake because these projects clearly are critical in improving the movement of freight in our country. In this upcoming reauthorization, the aggregate cap needs to be eliminated or greatly raised. We also need to talk about the structure of the program through which the money for mega projects is going to be dispersed. I do not believe we should continue to hand over the money to do this to any, president, any presidential administration, not just this one. But I don't think we should be handing it over for, for these decisions to be made over there. One thing I hope we can all agree upon, though, is that we need a robust level of funding for mega projects which are critical to freight movement in our country and other projects critical to transportation in the country that really cannot be addressed by the states alone. Climate change is one of the most pressing challenges facing us today, and there's an urgent need for bipartisan solutions. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency reports that the transportation sector is the largest emitter by sector of greenhouse gases, with 29 percent of the United States greenhouse gases in 2017 emitted by the transportation sector. One topic that I'd like to hear about from our witnesses today is how we can mitigate the impact of freight movement on climate change. Finally, we need to permanently authorize the 45G tax credit to give the short-line rail industry the investment certainty they need. This tax credit has been expired since the end of 2017, and it's time we take care of this issue once and for all. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today on how we can make the U.S. freight network more robust, multimodal, and climate-friendly. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. L <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Lipensky. I want to ask uh, the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Railroads, Pipeline, and Hazardous Materials, Mr. Crawford, for his opening statement. Thank you. I thank the chair for uh, recognizing me. Uh, modern freight network means a strong, secure America. Farmers and businesses across my state and indeed across the country uh, depend on our nation's freight rail rail railroads to safely transport their goods through throughout the country and the world. Important to Arkansas are short line railroads who most often provide first and last mile service for farmers, manufacturers, and other industries. I'm proud to support H.R. 510, the Brace Act, which would permanently extend the tax credit for short line railroad track maintenance, thereby increasing private investment in important rail transportation infrastructure. As total freight demand grows, the critical investments made by the railroads in both their people and in their infrastructure help ensure a safe and efficient transport system for our goods. This investment helps spur economic activity, drive innovation, and make operations safer and more efficient. In turn, the rail network can handle increased freight demand and help relieve congestion on our roads. I look forward to hearing about freight programs and the FAST Act and how Congress can improve the efficient flow of goods. Thank you, thank you to all of our witnesses for being here today, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Crawford. Um, I'd like to ask the chairman of the full committee, Mr. DeFazio, if he has an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, uh, I, I do have a brief opening statement. I want to thank you for uh, the, the uh, both uh, chairs and ranking members for holding uh, this important hearing. Uh, you know, we just had uh, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, and Americans think, you know, just one click and, and the goods magically appear. Uh, but they don't realize uh, the complexity of the network uh, upon which uh, they are dependent for those goods to appear. Uh, at the doorstep. In addition to uh, those sorts of issues, we obviously have 
um, you know, the supply chain uh, for industry. Uh, we have uh, connecting farmers produce from kitchen tables, uh, bringing logs uh, out of the mountains to the sawmills in my state. Uh, the U.S. freight transportation network is critical uh, to the uh, economy of this nation. 17.7 uh, .7 billion tons of freight uh, valued at $16.8 trillion uh, every year. Uh, but we have challenges ahead of us. By 2040, we expect volumes to grow by 40 percent. Uh, how are we going to meet uh, those demands, our existing infrastructure, add capacity nearing the end of, or in many cases has already passed its useful life, uh, but still limping along? Uh, and uh, how are we going to uh, how are we going to deal with this in the future? How are we going to uh, reduce the environmental burden uh, of the uh, of the freight industry, both in terms of pollution and urban areas, and also in terms of the carbon that uh, it contributes uh, to uh, climate change? Uh, you know, medium and heavy-duty trucks uh, contributed 23 percent of all transportation-related greenhouse gas emissions in 17. And I hope uh, to hear today uh, ideas about how we're going to reduce that burden. The freight railroads have been uh, working uh, to deploy technologies. Uh, they have been upgrading their fleets, uh, reducing idling and fuel consumption, and they are uh, obviously a, a more uh, efficient uh, per gallon, uh, you know, uh, per freight mile uh, deliverer of, of goods. Um, and so uh, they, they've done quite a bit, but uh, we're going to need to do more there too. Uh, Nine billion gallons uh, fewer uh, between 2018, 100 million fewer tons of carbon dioxide. But uh, you know, can we move beyond that? I think we need to. Uh, as we'll hear in testimony today, a significant portion of freight growth and disproportionate share of the cost of freight movements comes from the last mile. Uh, we've been reading some articles about congestion in our urban areas that's uh, extraordinary because of, of uh, this uh, delivery, uh, adding new burdens to an already overburdened system. And, uh, you know, we have to, uh, this is, you know, that normally these areas were not considered integral uh, to freight movement, but uh, they have become uh, so. Uh, so uh, we're going to have to uh, figure out how we're going to deal with that. Again, the pollution, the carbon, uh, and and so forth. Um, in the last bill, it was the first time in the FAST Act, really, that we established a, a dedicated funding source for freight. As important as it is, it has been neglected in terms of uh, our investment, as has the whole system been neglected by our levels of investment. Uh, and I'm, I'm trying and hoping uh, that we will do much better in our reauthorization. Uh, the DOT uh, created uh, the uh, infra program, nationally significant freight and highway projects program, uh, but it was uh, basically all the money was snapped up and there was a huge line of uh, very meritorious projects uh, waiting for funding. So, uh, you know, we're going to have to both tighten up uh, the, the criteria for grants uh, that are coming out of DOT, uh, but also we're going to need uh, to put uh, more, uh, more money into those programs. So with that, Madam Chair, I look forward to hearing from the witnesses and thank you for holding the hearing. Thank you, Mr. DeFazio. I'd now like to welcome our witnesses, and I'm going to go first to Erin uh, Aaron Elman. Mm -hmm. She is the executive director of the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning on behalf of the coalition. She's here on behalf of the Coalition for America's Gateways and Trade Corridors. Ms. Uh, Elman. Thank, thank you this morning for the opportunity to testify. I'm here on both behalf of the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning and also on behalf of the Coalition for America's Gateways and Trade Corridors, a coalition of public and private partners who are dedicated to investing in America's multimodal freight infrastructure. Thank you for your leadership, Chair Norton, Chairman Lipinski, Ranking Member Davis, and Ranking Member Crawford, and members of the subcommittees for the opportunity to share my views today. Investment in multimodal freight infrastructure is critical to this nation's economy. Our nation's ability to move goods safely, reliably, and responsibly to consumer demands will keep American businesses competitive in a global mar marketplace. Chronic underinvestment in our nation's transportation system has resulted in companies spending $27 billion annually in expenses due to freight congestion. Speak up a little more, please. Could you speak up a little? I'm sorry. A little. Yeah, there you go. Sorry. Uh, with FAST Act reauthorization around the corner, I'm here today to ask you to include a robust freight program. 
I applaud members of this committee for prioritizing freight infrastructure in the FAST Act. The program sparked an important dialogue and brought into focus the incredible magnitude of freight needs across our country. I'd like to highlight how FAST Act supported the Chicago region, changing how we pursue competitive funds, leveraging additional resources, and ensuring the projects that we put forth provide the greatest return on investment. Prior to CMAP, I was the, on the team at the Illinois Department of Transportation, working closely with CREATE partners as we developed our infra application for the 75th Street Corridor Improvement Project. By untangling one of the worst bottlenecks in the nation, $3.8 billion of economic benefits will be seen upon completion. Because the economic benefit was so great and the need was so significant, we came together to prioritize this project amongst individual needs. Together, the CREATE partners, both public and private, matched more than two and a half times the federal infra ask. While more funding is necessary to complete the project, this project and investment will improve the reliability of 200 freight, 30 passenger, and 10 Amtrak trains daily. Many of the largest and most complex freight improvements across our country cross state boundaries and occur where multiple modes come together. These projects require a partnership at the federal level to untangle, untangle choke, choke points that burden our community and slow commerce. Our region has successfully shown that prioritizing multimodal freight investment leads to success. For example, whereas it once took 40 hours for freight trains to get through Chicago, it now takes 25 to 30 hours, but more improvement is necessary. While we've been able to address some of these problems on our own, the fact is that states cannot and should not shoulder the burden of nationally significant freight movement alone. Freight isn't confined to a single community or state. More than 77% of US freight crosses state lines. I've often said that the public doesn't care who has jurisdiction over the roads they're driving on. The same can be said about our freight network. Businesses and consumers simply want a reliable system that gets their goods to market or delivers their packages to their houses on time. To address our urgent freight needs and build on successes, the coalition respectfully submits four recommendations. First, a national strategy that guides long-term planning. An Office of Multimodal Freight should be established within USDOT's Office of the Secretary, emphasizing nationally significant projects. Second, dedicated, sustainable, and flexible funding. In 2018, the INFRA program received $12 of unique requests for every $1 available. Given this level of oversubscription, we request $12 billion be invested annually in multimodal freight throughout the competitive programs. Congress should also eliminate caps on non-highway spending. Third, projects should be selected through a performance-based program and framework that allows us to prioritize projects that improve national freight efficiency. Oversight and transparency in the decision-making process is critical to the program's integrity. And finally, funding should leverage private participation and support a variety of financing options. The FASTX programs are increasing the safety, efficiency, and reliability of how we move our goods. Consumer demands have shifted dr dramatically over the years, and the planner in me knows that more change is on the horizon. We must be proactive about investing and prioritizing our critical freight infrastructure needs. On behalf of the coalition and CMAP, I thank the committees for their, their time and attention to this critically important topic. Thank you, Ms. Ailman. Uh, we go now to uh, Chuck Baker, president of the American Short Line and Regional Railroad Association. Thank you, Chairman, Chairwoman, Ranking Members, and members of the subcommittees. I'm Chuck Baker, and I'm president of the American Short Line and Regional Railroad Association, representing the nation's 603 small railroads. This hearing will explore the economic, environmental, and societal impacts of freight transportation, and you have asked me to tell you, where's my stuff as it relates to the short line railroad industry? Well, I'm happy to report that short line railroads have lots of stuff, it's the right stuff, and we are here to transport America's stuff in a safe, efficient, and environmentally friendly manner. Together, short-line railroads operate nearly 50,000 miles of track, or approximately 30% of the national rail network, and employ more than 17,000 hardworking Americans. We operate in 49 states. Short lines are often called the first mile and last mile of the nation's railroad system. The name short line can create the mistaken impression that all of these railroads are very short in length, the fact is we come in all sizes. The Peru Industrial Railroad in Illinois is three miles long. 
The Portland and Western is 516 miles long. Pan Am Railways operates 1,700 miles and provides the majority of rail service in New England. Our common denominators are that we operate track that was not viable under the structure of the previous owners. We run lean and mean. We stay very close to our customers. We're dedicated to safety and we hustle, scratch, and claw for every last carload of stuff we can help move. Short lines have the right economic stuff. Short lines preserve service over track that was previously headed for abandonment. Particularly for small town and rural America, short line railroad service is the only connection to the national network. For the businesses and farmers in those areas, our ability to take a 25 car train 75 miles to the nearest class one interchange is just as important as the class one's ability to attach that block of traffic to a 100 car train and move it across the country. Railroads are an all American proposition. Virtually everything we buy for infrastructure improvement, the ties, the rails, the ballast, the locomotives, the freight cars, it's made in America. So every dollar we spend is spent in America. As those of you who represent rural areas know, it is difficult to create jobs in rural America. Short lines and the shippers we serve are a significant source of good paying jobs in rural America. Short line railroads lower transportation costs for our shippers because one rail car holds the equivalent of three to four truckloads worth of stuff and we use fuel more efficiently than trucks. Using an example from Oklahoma, moving a ton of freight 95 miles from Clinton to Enid via rail provides a 40% savings per mile versus truck. That level of savings exists across the country and is a very meaningful number for the businesses we serve. I will not pretend that the numbers I'm talking about are a huge deal in an economy measured in the trillions. However, for those shippers we keep connected, for those communities where we create economic activity, for the employees we hire, these are meaningful numbers. It is not the biggest stuff, but it is important stuff. Short lines have the right environmental stuff. Railroads are the most fuel efficient way to move freight over land three to four times more fuel efficient than trucks. Today, a freight train can move one ton of freight an average of more than 470 miles on one gallon of diesel. The EPA has measured the sources of transportation related greenhouse gas emissions and rail is a big success story. Cars and light trucks account for 60%, heavy trucking is 23%, air travel is 9% and freight rail is only 2%. Highway congestion, in addition to being a soul destroying way to spend your time, is also a significant contributor to harmful emissions. The average rail car holds the equivalent of three to four truckloads, and removing those trucks from the highway helps reduce congestion. Finally, short lines have the right societal stuff. Rail is the safest option for moving freight by land in America. Measured on a comparable ton miles basis, rail is approximately three to five times safer than trucking. Short lines are proud of our safety culture and work diligently to reduce and eliminate injuries. In 2018, 265 of our short lines reported zero accidents. The average accident that rate year was a near record low of 1.84 per million train miles. Because rail is the safest option for moving freight by land, any policies that Congress enacts that affect the balance between rail and trucking also affect public safety and have major societal impacts. As this committee considers a surface transportation bill, my written testimony offers specific policy recommendations that we believe will improve the economic, environmental, and societal impacts of freight transportation in America, such as supporting the Chrissy Grant Program, improving the infra and state freight formula programs by making them more multimodal, maintaining the current truck size and weight limits, refraining from an unnecessary federal law on train crew sizes, returning the highway trust fund to something resembling a user funded system, and of course, our favorite topic, extending the short line rehabilitation tax credit. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Uh, Ms. Goodchild, you're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairs Norton and Lipinski, and ranking members Davis and Crawford, as well as distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you about this important topic. My name is Anne Goodchild. I am a professor of civil and environmental engineering at the University of Washington and the director of the Supply Chain Transportation and Logistics Center. I am the founding director of the Urban Freight Lab and an urban freight expert. It is an uncommon pleasure to be in a room full of policymakers so interested in freight transportation. The freight system allows for economic specialization and is a requirement for city living, provides markets to producers and strengthens competition. 
I'm here today to highlight that freight infrastructure is more than interstates, ports, pipelines, and rail facilities. It is also city streets, curbs, and sidewalks. This is where a supply chain's last mile is carried out. That is the infrastructure that gets a good to its final destination. When we talk about freight infrastructure investment and building a better freight system, we must include the last mile and even the final 50 feet. Investments in this infrastructure and innovations in the last mile provide a substantial opportunity to improve supply chain efficiency, more effectively delivering essential services and the economic and social benefits that they promise. The last mile is not, as the name suggests, a small part of the freight system. It is the current obsession of the supply chain industry and an increasing burden for cities and neighborhoods. The last mile is the most difficult and costly mile of the entire freight system, estimated to absorb between 25 and 50% of total supply chain transportation spend. Dramatic growth in online shopping and faster and faster home delivery is increasing the cost of the last mile and the amount of last mile traffic. Investments in improving the last mile and the final 50 feet infrastructure will bring disproportionate benefits to the freight system, carriers, and consumers. We will have to rethink how we build and manage our infrastructure if it is to accommodate the expected growth in delivery services. Departments of transportation are facing many rapid and complex changes and competing demands for space. For example, growth in home delivery, the use of ride hailing services, the construction of dedicated bike lanes, and autonomous vehicles all want additional curb space. Relying on intuition can lead to policies such as truck bans that actually increase congestion and emissions. In fact, our research demonstrates that organized, efficient freight carriers reduce traffic and emissions because a single delivery truck can replace dozens of car trips. On the street, we see high rates of unauthorized parking, long dwell times, and high failed delivery rates, which means both poorly utilized vehicles and drivers, high emissions, and poorly utilized public space. Developing uh, effective solutions to these urban freight challenges requires new approaches. We need evidence-based solutions that will improve efficiency for carriers and improve transportation system performance. In the face of a fast-changing industry, limited data and freight planning capacity, this requires new approaches. Our response at the University of Washington was to establish the Urban Freight Lab, an innovative partnership between private industry, academic researchers, and the Seattle DOT, as well as other public sector, uh, to jointly solve urban freight problems. Private sector members, as well as the public sector, contribute financially to the research and collectively decide on a research agenda. While all members contribute and play an essential role in defining and identifying needs, lab fees do not and should not cover the cost of all research. The findings have national impact and testing solutions at scale cannot be the responsibility of only this group. Important financial support for the center also comes from the Department of Energy, uh, Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy and the University Transportation Center program. These and other federal programs play an essential role in sponsoring and guiding the direction of national research. I encourage you to include approaches to study and improve urban freight performance in future <laughs> policies. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Goodchild. Um, now recognize uh, Mr. Jeffries. Good morning. Chair Stefazio, Holmes Norton and Lipinski, Ranking Member Davis, Crawford, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to be here today representing U.S. freight railroads. As you examine the capability of U.S. freight modes to meet the challenges of today and tomorrow, know this, due to sustained private investment, the freight rail network is in the best shape of its storied history. Today's railroad is different than the railroad of the past, but the capital intensive nature is a constant 
enabling railroads to safely serve today's customers and plan for tomorrow's demands. Case in point, in the past three years, Class I railroads averaged $25 billion in private investments to manage and upgrade infrastructure and equipment. That's more than $68 million a day of private capital poured back into our network. This year is no different. Class I CapEx is up almost $1 billion through the third quarter of this year, year over year. Railroads play the long game, and the industry is executing a strong vision for the future. The positive impacts of this vision can be found every day. First, railroads operate safely. Railroads maintain a safety culture second to none, constantly looking for ways to further the safety improvements performance. The evidence of this commitment is clear. In 2018, the train accident rate was down 36% from the year 2000, while the employee accident rate was its second lowest in history, down 48%. To continue these trends, the industry is deploying new inspection and detection technologies that allow for significantly more advanced assessments of rail, track, and locomotive health. We will not be satisfied until we reach a future of zero incidents. Second, railroads are the most environmentally sound way to move freight over land. To reiterate what my colleague said, on average, railroads move a ton of freight 473 miles per gallon of diesel fuel. To put that in perspective, that's equal to moving a ton of freight on one gallon of diesel from D.C. to Cincinnati or Chicago to Omaha. While moving nearly one-third of long-distance freight volume, railroads account for just 2% of transportation-related greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, if just 10% of freight that's currently moved by trucks were transported by rail instead, annual greenhouse gas emissions would fall by more than 17 million tons. Third, railroads alleviate highway congestion and deterioration. Because a single train can carry the freight of several hundred trucks, railroads cut gridlock and lower the cost of road construction and upkeep. And finally, freight rail is a critical economic engine. U.S. freight railroads move roughly 40% of intercity ton miles of freight, ship a third of U.S. exports, and support more than one million jobs across the nation. So looking forward, a positive future for freight rail and other transportation modes relies on a sound public policy. Robust private investment in the rail sector is made possible by a balanced economic regulatory system overseen by the Surface Transportation Board that relies on market-based competition while providing a backstop for rail customers. The structure benefits the entire freight ecosystem. Rail rates in 2018 were 44% lower than they were in 1981 when adjusted for inflation. To continue the success story, the STB must adhere to sound economic principles in all actions and reject re-regulatory efforts by some stakeholders. At the same time, Congress has a role to ensure modal equity across freight transportation by fixing the Highway Trust Fund. To do this, Railroads believe a mileage-based solution, such as a weight distance fee, is the most appropriate and sustainable long-term solution. I give credit to my friends in the trucking industry for advocating for a higher gas tax. The bottom line, though, all stakeholders agree a viable funding solution is a must, one that enables full cost recovery for highway wear and tear. In closing, privately owned railroads have their eyes on the future. The industry will continue to invest to meet market demand and maintain our core role in the nation's integrated transportation network. We look forward to working with this committee and others in Congress as you look towards surface transportation reauthorization and develop and implement policies that best meet this country's infrastructure needs. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jeffries. I'm gonna go back and uh, make sure I uh, say this because I think I did, I forgot to do it. Mr. Jeffries is the president and CEO of the Association of American Railroads. And uh, I was up here for uh, Ms. Goodchild, so I, I know I skipped that. Ms. Ann Goodchild, PhD, and founding director, supply chair, transportation, and logistics center, University of Washington. So go back and uh, correct that. And I will move on to uh, recognize Mr. Jason Mathers, the director of vehicle and freight strategy, vehicle and freight strategy with the Environmental Defense Fund. Mr. Mathers, you're recognized. Right. Uh, Thank you, uh, Chair Lipinski, Chair Norton, ranking members Davis and Crawford, and uh, members of the subcommittee for, for having me here today. 
now is the time to implement policies that will reduce air pollution and set us on a path of net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Earlier this year, the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee unanimously approved its version of the highway reauthorization bill. And for the first time ever, it included a title on climate change. This committee can build on that effort in its version and lock in the certainty needed to unleash public and private investment to clean up the transportation sector. Pollution from freight transportation has pernicious health impacts on communities near freight facilities and highways. Heavy trucks are by far the most significant source of freight pollution, yet reducing pollution from freight movement is not primarily a technology matter, it is a matter of political will. The, operation, the operational and equipment choices that can drive down air pollution are well known. Many of these are being used today to create business value while improving community health. With congressional leadership, we can make tremendous strides in reducing the nearly 11,000 premature deaths annually that occur from exposure to freight pollution in this country and put the sector on a path to contribute to a 100% clean economy by 2050. A few years back, I authored the Green Freight Handbook, which examined opportunities for freight shippers to reduce pollution. This work was based on projects EDF undertook with large companies including Walmart, FedEx, Ocean Spray, and Caterpillar, among others. We condensed into three broad categories the range of tactics companies can use to reduce freight pollution and transportation costs. These are, first, get the most out of every move, which is about making sure that we use our freight capacity to the fullest. Second, choosing the most efficient mode of transportation, which is about sending goods uh, intermodally rather than just by truck alone, and demand cleaner equipment. My testimony has examples of all these categories. I will focus now on this last category. Zero emission heavy duty vehicles are increasingly, <clears throat> zero emission heavy duty vehicles are increasingly viable for freight. Services these trucks can do today include transporting cargo in and out of ports, like NFI, one of the nation's largest fleets is doing today in LA Long Beach. Moving freight from a distribution center to a retail outlet, like Penske is doing for a leading quick service restaurant chain positioning trailers within a distribution yard, as Kraft is doing in Ohio, and delivering packages to business and homes, as FedEx is doing. We should invest in these trucks with policies that reward innovation and recognize the full cost of operating combustion engines. Investing in zero emission trucks is a win-win opportunity. Fleets want these trucks as they can drastically reduce fuel spend, Developing the manufacturing capacity for these vehicles will support good jobs, and households across this country will see lower cost goods. Congress could make this investment through policies that advance four objectives. First, encourage the production of zero emission heavy duty vehicles. Second, increase the demand for these vehicles. Third, ensure public expenditures drive just and equitable outcomes. And fourth, support the development of appropriate charging infrastructure. As this committee considers the highway reauthorization, I want to provide two specific ideas. First, create a commission to develop strategies for transitioning drayage trucks, those trucks moving goods in and out of ports and rail yards to zero emission. The work performed by these trucks is a great match for the zero emission technology. And given that they typically operate in urban environments, these trucks are highly polluting. There are unique challenges to move the sector to zero emissions. These can be overcome. A federal, a federal commission should be established to develop recommendations for fully transitioning these vehicles to zero emissions by 2030. Second, create a federal revolving loan fund for the purchase and installation of EV charging infrastructure. Creating charging systems for trucks remains a barrier. Congress could create a fund to help offset costs associated with charging equipment, facility upgrades, and, grid, and the grid improvements necessary to power large fleets. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mathers. Uh, now recognize Mr. Jim Tyman, Executive Director, American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials. Mr. Tyman, you're recognized. Thank you. Chair Norton, Chairman Lipinski, Ranking Member Davis, Ranking Member Crawford, and members of the subcommittee. 
Thank you for the opportunity to provide the perspective of the nation's state departments of transportation on freight transportation. My name is Jim Timon, and I serve as the executive director of the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, and it is my honor to testify on behalf of AASHTO's membership comprising the state departments of transportation for all 50 states, Washington, D.C., and Puerto Rico. My remarks today center around the following key points. Importance of freight transportation in the context of surface transportation reauthorization. AASHTO's core principles for reauthorization, including freight, uh, federal freight policy, and specific freight policy recommendations for the next surface transportation bill. State DOTs strive to deliver the most effective and efficient surface transportation system that strengthens and grows the economy. It is the interconnected national multimodal transportation system with states as a principal owner and operator of that system that has enabled the United States to become the most vibrant and powerful nation in history. To that end, we strongly support your efforts to enact a well-funded multi-year surface transportation reauthorization bill prior to the expiration of the FAST Act on September 30th, 2020. Nearly two years ago, AASHTO began soliciting input from policy experts in all 50 states on surface transportation reauthorization. Based on this membership-driven approach, I would like to share with you our core policy principles. First, ensure timely reauthorization of a long-term federal surface transportation bill. Getting the next bill completed on time will ensure uninterrupted investment in our freight transportation infrastructure, which in turn will enable us to build on the current economic expansion. Second, enact a long-term sustainable revenue solution for the Highway Trust Fund. Our current funding challenges demand bold action to invest in our transportation infrastructure. This action has the clear support of the American public, and it is time for the President and Congress to make it happen. Third, increase and prioritize formula-based federal funding provided to the states. The next reauthor in the next reauthorization, we urge you to focus on maximizing federal formula-based dollars provided directly to states through the existing Highway Core Formula programs. Efficient goods movement nationwide is dependent on the interstate highway system and the national highway system. Many of these facilities are over 50 years old and nearing the end of their useful life. States rely on these formula dollars to keep these assets in a state of good repair. The next bill should continue to provide 90% of highway funding to states by formulas so that states can continue to provide an efficient system for the movement of people and freight. Fourth, we ask that you increase flexibility, reduce program burdens, and improve project delivery. We recommend increased flexibility of and transferability between the various federal programs to enable states to target their scarce resources toward the most beneficial freight programs and projects. Transportation priorities here in the District of Columbia are different from the priorities in rural Arkansas, and we should continue to provide states the program level flexibility to use federal dollars as efficiently as possible. In addition, assigning more decision-making authority to the states and cutting unnecessary red tape will help these projects get built faster. Fifth, support and ensure state DOT's ability to harness innovation and technology. Specifically, we need to preserve the 5.9 gigahertz spectrum for transportation safety and connectivity purposes. For example, a USD funded, USDOT funded connected vehicle pilot program on I-80 in Wyoming has used the spectrum to improve snow related incident management in the corridor that carries 55% of all traffic in that state. In addition to these core principles, we recommend in the next bill that you expand eligibility to use federal freight program dollars on any portion of a state's multimodal freight network as defined in the state's freight plan, increase FAST Act fund freight funding caps for multimodal projects, reinstate additional funding for the National Cooperative Freight Research Program, and help identify ways to improve coordination between states and railroad partners. State DOTs remain committed to assisting Congress in the development of the next surface transportation legislation that further enables freight transportation to improve our quality of life and grow the economy. 
I want to thank you again for the opportunity to testify today, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Tymon. Uh, I want to thank all of our witnesses for your testimony today. We're now going to move on to uh, member questions. Each member will be recognized for five minutes, and I will start by recognizing myself. Uh, first thing I wanted to address is the uh, Section 130 program for, for grade separations. I wanted to uh, you know, ask Mr. Jeffries, I know you, can you elaborate on your thoughts in your written testimony where you talk about how we can improve the Section 130 uh, grade crossing safety program? Absolutely, thank you. So Section 130 is, is one of our primary uh, priorities when it comes to FAST Act reauthorization, and we've, we've laid out a detailed proposal attached to my written statement, but a few examples that we would like to, to see is one, um, you know, any, any increase in funding or even fully funding the authorized level of the program, you know, is a step in the right direction, but um, another example would be increasing the flexibility of funds, that how funds can be used. Um, right now, if you, you use Section 130 funds to, to implement some grade crossing safety devices, um, time goes by, there are more effective devices that come, on, come available. You cannot use Section 130 funding uh, to upgrade, and we think that it's common sense to allow for upgrades, especially at those higher risk crossings, uh, to make sure you have the most uh, up-to-date uh, technology available. Thank you. And, and grade separations, uh, I mean, Section 130 covers all grade crossing safety programs. Grade separations are the, uh, uh, the best way uh, to it improves safety. I want to ask Ms. Ailman, uh, would the establishment of a dedicated federal grade crossing separation program that could help advance some of the grade separations still unfunded in CREATE be a good idea? Because CREATE has made great strides um, over the 15 years, but one thing that has lagged far behind is the grade separations. There are 25 that were included in uh, originally, and uh, less than half of those have, have been, been funded. So. Ailman? Yes, uh, addressing the grade separations is of critical importance, not only to the CREATE program, but to the movement of freight in our region and beyond. Um, like you said, 25 uh, create, CREATE grade separations have been identified. Of those, only seven have been completed. Um, this clearly shows that there's a need for additional funding to be able to address those critical cross points. Thank you, and, and I just wanted to um, make sure, uh, ask about this. I know a couple of witnesses raised it, and I raised it in my opening statement. Uh, I just want to see by a show of hands, how many witnesses support eliminating or greatly raising the multimodal cap in the uh, infra or what, whatever kind of mega projects program we're going to have? Uh, I'm just abstaining. I'm not not voting. <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you. I was going to ask that. Um, it's the big question is how do we uh, how do we structure this program? And I, I don't want to keep talking about the infra program itself because what we have done with each of the past reauthorizations is we create a somewhat different program. So I don't want to just say that we're going to go move ahead with, with infra, um, but there has to be something for mega projects. But how do we how do we target that in? Uh, I'll start with uh, Ms. Ailman. You know, given the limited amount of federal dollars, uh, sh should our freight strategic plan and our me mega project dollars focus on uh, freight infrastructure bottlenecks or improving the large freight network generally? Uh, so how do we how do we do that in terms of targeting? What would you recommend? I'd recommend a comprehensive look at our national freight infrastructure as it exists today. I mean, really taking a comprehensive look across the United States um, will help Congress be able to evaluate the effectiveness of the programs that we've had to date, and will also allow um, you to shape future reauthorization. So while we may not be able to increase funds, I think thinking about this in a performance-based way, where you're applying those metrics on a national system as opposed to locally, um, will help um, greatly improve um, the next transportation bill. Thank you. I just very quickly want to ask uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Goodchild. Uh, yesterday, New York uh, DOT announced a pilot freight program which will encourage the use of cargo electric bikes instead of trucks to move freight within New York City. I'm just personally uh, intrigued by this and how this would actually work. I'm not sure where these cargo bikes are, are going to go, but is, is this something that uh, 
have you looked at this and would this type of climate friendly transportation mode uh, play an important role? So I am currently leading a project to evaluate a pilot of an electric assist cargo bike uh, in the city of Seattle. And so our task there is to evaluate the environmental safety and efficiency benefits of that approach. Um, there's some complexity in that because the, it doesn't replace a truck. Uh, it can only move smaller packages and it has a much shorter range and so it's used in complement with a truck and it's important when we evaluate this system to look at the relationship between those two modes. Um, certainly it's a more nimble vehicle and depending on what the rules are, if it's allowed to, to use a bike lane or if it's allowed to park in a sidewalk or if it's allowed to park in a commercial vehicle load zone, um, it can provide some better maneuverability at a, at a local scale. Um, and if it's electric, then there's the local zero emissions benefit of that mode. Thank you, we'll, we'll look forward to uh, seeing the re results there. So uh, my time has expired. I will now uh, yield five minutes to Mr. Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thanks again to the witnesses. Enjoyed your testimony. Uh, and I, I wish I had longer than five minutes to get to each of you to ask a, a few different questions, but I don't, so I'll start with Mr. Tymon. Uh, I, uh, in your testimony, you mentioned that the freight plans that each state has uh, developed, and can you describe any trends that were identified across multiple states uh, and strategies that were employed to address these needs? I'm sorry, uh, cross... Yeah, can you uh, describe any trends? Uh, you, you mentioned the freight plans that each state has. Are there any trends that kind of go beyond state lines that uh, were employed to address kind of the, the freight strategies? Well, I think the important point here is that uh, each state is required to put together a, a, a state freight plan. And you're seeing that states are working with their, uh, their partners across borders to identify uh, projects that, that cut across states. As everybody here knows, uh, freight doesn't just stop at the state line, and it's important that states are able to work with their, uh, with their neighbors to make sure that that freight is moving uh, as efficiently as possible. So uh, most, I think, of the freight projects that are identified uh, are done in concert with their neighbors to make sure that once you get to a state border, uh, that that freight doesn't back up there because the state on the other side of that border hasn't uh, worked to make similar improvements. So uh, we are seeing more and more coordination among states as they put together these plans to make sure that freight moves as efficiently as possible. Well, good, have, have you seen the states uh, finding strategic value in, in the plans that uh, they've put in place and have, they, have those plans helped to reduce congestion? I don't think that it's, uh, I don't think we have enough of a, a sample size to be able to say whether or not we're reducing congestion, but I think it is a step in the right direction. It has uh, really required states to take a look at their entire inventory uh, that handles freight transportation uh, to make sure that they're investing, they're making the investments that uh, benefit freight uh, as efficiently as possible. Okay, well, in, in my home state of Illinois, they took an innovative approach uh, using their formula freight dollars to develop a transparent competitive grant program uh, that's open to stakeholder applications. It's like kind of a state level infra grant program. Uh, what other innovative approaches have other states taken to use their freight formula funds and have they allowed states to leverage more dollars uh, for reducing congestion and improving performance? Absolutely. We're seeing uh, the, the federal dollars in, in a lot of cases being used as seed money for, uh, to bring in local dollars to, do, uh, to address freight bottlenecks. Uh, the example that you've given in Illinois is a great example of states having the flexibility uh, to use those formula dollars to create a program that works in that state by essentially setting up a, a mini infra grant program where it's competitive and you're inviting um, other stakeholders to come to the table with their innovative ideas. Uh, if, if states didn't have that flexibility, we wouldn't be able to do projects like that in, in Illinois. Great. Uh, Ms. Ailman, uh, it's great to sit here with my good friend, uh, Chairman Lipinski, who uh, I know is always looking at uh, improving uh, the CREATE project. Uh, we've talked about it in my entire six and a half years here uh, working with him on this issue. And I know you mentioned uh, how CREATE uh, in your testimony will improve the rail system in a, our home state of Illinois. Um, 
how does improved efficiency in the Chicago rail network benefit uh, agriculture and manufacturers in the 13th district that I represent in central Illinois? Sure. I think a great example is that in 2014, there was a severe weather incident that really shut down and, and reduced the, the delivery service and infrastructure network in Chicago. And what that meant was that um, it was prime agriculture movement season, um, that, that produce was rotting on cars and train cars because they couldn't get through Chicago. And that produce wasn't headed towards Chicago. It was headed towards other parts of the country. So, you know, 25% of all freight trains and 50% of all intermodal trains from the nation's goods movement cross through Chicago. Um, so this really is a, a national issue and something that we really need to think comprehensively about. Great. It's, it's important, obviously, uh, being a, a center of, of freight movement in the Midwest, uh, not just uh, the rail network, but also our, our locks and dams, waterways, uh, and our roadways and infrastructure improvements. Uh, one last question. As somebody who believes we need to, to pass the, the USMCA through this institution, can you estimate how much traffic through the uh, Chicago Rail Network would go to our most our greatest trading partners, Canada and Mexico? I don't have those numbers at my fingertips, but I can get them for you for the record. Thank you. That'd be great. I yield back the balance of my time. And I'll recognize uh, Ms. Norton for uh, five minutes. Thank you very, very much. Um, you will note the uh, interest in this committee in multimodal investments, multimodal approaches. Uh, 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 and of course, our, the way in which we we allocate funds is anything but that. It's stovepipe funding, which makes this even more challenging. Um, uh, I, I, we, we also know that, it, that railroads for the first time <laughs> were included, or at least freight needs, were included in the um, FAST Act for the first time. That's really amazing, isn't it? Uh, considering how important freight has always been. Uh, and, and of course, Mr. Lipinski um, spoke about the cap on funding. Uh, I'm not sure how funding op would operate, but I would like to ask perhaps Mr. Timon, Ms. Uh, Elman, um, uh, why flexibility? to pursue multimodal investments to meet freight needs, why that is important to, to states or to cities, to planning agencies, and why you view it as an appropriate uh, use of program funds. So, from our perspective, freight doesn't move on highways alone, as you see from the stakeholders that are here today. We've got rail. Um, also in our state and across the country, there are ports. And we believe that where our public goods are moving, uh, public dollars should be invested. And, and we absolutely agree that uh, you know state DOTs right now are all departments of transportation. Gone are the days where we had departments of roads or departments of highways. All 50 states now have transportation as part of their name. And I think that reflects a movement towards a multimodal approach to transportation. Uh, it's not just about moving freight by one mode or another, it's an all of the above approach. And, and I think in order to solve the, the challenges that we have, both on the freight and the passenger side, we need to be looking at all modes of transportation and we need the federal programs pr to provide that flexibility so that states can choose the projects and strategies that work best in that state. Thank you, uh, Ms. Ailman. I was intrigued uh, uh, by um, a suggestion on, I th think it's page eight of your testimony, develop a national strategy that guides long-term planning. Uh, and you even say that there should be an office of multimodal freight. Uh, We've heard here that everything from the curbs to, uh, it's, it, 
that's down to the last last uh, inch of infrastructure is simply not ready for the 21st century. Would you talk more about this national strategy? Thank you, Chairwoman. Um, the national strategy is critical because we have the data to know where the freight bottlenecks are across this country, and we can use that as our North Star for programming project funds and making sure that the projects that are funded are advancing the goals of, of this country and of, of Congress. And so that allows you a measurable tool to be able to look back and track your progress over time and hold these, these, these programs and these, that are, um, uh, these discretionary funds more accountable. So I take it, um, 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 Dr. Goodchild, um, your testimony uh, highlighted the importance of supporting cities and local communities to grapple with this rapidly changing freight supply chain. Um, what kind of tools would help um, cities uh, build the capacity to plan for the future of freight deliveries, which are changing and perhaps becoming obsolete even as they develop those strategies. That's why I asked Mr. Ailman, Dr. Ail, Ms. Ailman about uh, uh, long-term planning. But what kind of tools do, do, do you have in mind? So one would be data about goods movement that's relevant at sort of the municipal scale or, or even mega region scale. Um, when we just look at state to state or, or regional data like the Puget Sound, it doesn't provide any insight about movements within the region of the Puget Sound. Um, another would be to encourage groups like the Urban Freight Lab, local collaborations that could contribute to defining local problems, and there could be a federal role in, in supporting and initiating and in catalyzing those kinds of organizations. Thank you very much. I see my time has expired. Thank you, Chairwoman Norton. Uh, Chair, I'll now recognize Mr. Crawford for five minutes. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to start, Mr. Jeffries, I'm going to direct this question to you. The advancement of technology over the past few decades is undeniable. It's led to tremendous gains throughout the economy. Can you provide some examples of how technology is being used in the rail industry and the impacts they're having, and what do you think Congress can do to ensure an environment where future technologies are not stymied by regulatory burdens? Absolutely, thank you. So, I mean, you hit the nail on the head that, that technology has played an evolutionary role in the railroad. If you look at where it was 10, 15, 20 years ago, today's railroad, while it's still steel on steel, is it's a completely different animal. You know, locomotives are supercomputers on wheels, and they're able to do, you know, gather data throughout every aspect of the trip, um, pair that with uh, detectors and, and um, other, other inspection equipment that's, that's along the right-of-way throughout the system that's listening, watching, um, and, and analyzing uh, the, not only the track as you go over it, but also the locomotive as it comes by to identify potential flaws in the system, potential risk areas. It allows you to, through predictive analytics, to identify um, possible, possible risks before they become serious problems. Um, even on the, the environmental side, um, you know, uh, using emissionless cranes in the yards, um, idle reduction technology in the yards to reduce emissions in yard movements, which is where a lot of the emissions occur. Um, and, and really, you know, our, our main issue is let's, when we look at regulations, let, let's talk about where we want to go and let, let railroads find that path to, to meet the outcome that, that Congress or the regulator um, is, is staking out. And, um, <clears throat> Pardon me. Let's uh, let, let's not focus on you know the, the prescriptive way to get there because I think you know ingenuity is a powerful tool and it's uh, it's amazing what people will come up with if you if you tell them the goal and let them get there you know via their their best methods. Excellent. Thank you. Um, this is just general. Anybody wants to chime in, feel free. Is the current rate of highway capacity growth sufficient to address the growing freight demand and. Uh, what do we need? What what's the expanded capacity uh, is needed the most? So, Mr. Crawford, I I think that uh, that that's a great question because I think it varies uh, depending on what part of the country you're in. 
Uh, right now, I think that's number one priority for state DOTs is maintaining the assets that they currently have. But there are certainly some parts of the country and on certain facilities where additional highway capacity will help improve the efficient movement of both people and freight. Uh, with the projected growth that we are going to see in freight transportation in the future, uh, I would have to assume that there are multiple projects in each state across the country where additional capacity will help make sure that that freight continues to move as efficiently as possible. You think the demand for freight transportation is directly correlated to highway capacity or is it more closely tied to other factors like economic growth? I think that it's a, it's a combination of things. I, I think that um, as the economy grows and, and the country demands more products and goods, there's just going to be more of a demand on the system. Uh, how we meet that demand, whether it's, uh, I think it will have to be a multimodal approach. I think it's going to have to be an all of the above approach. It will have to be, in some cases, additional highway capacity, but it'll also have to be uh, additional freight rail capacity in some way, shape, or form. So. Uh, you know, I think the state DOTs out there are looking for multimodal solutions, not just one solution, but I do think that highway capacity increases are part of that solution. Um, in your view, what are the most significant trends in transportation and distribution that will impact where, how, how much freight will be moving over the nation's highways in the coming years? I'm sorry, could you repeat that again? It's uh, it, what are the most significant trends that you see in, in uh, transportation and distribution that would impact where, how, and how much freight would be moving over the nation's highways in the, in the years to come? I, I think the, the number one uh, trend that we're seeing is, is uh, changes in how people uh, expect to get their goods and services, right? I mean, uh, I think uh, Chairman DeFazio mentioned earlier, we're just through Black Friday and Cyber Monday. And the, the real-time nature of what people expect and now demand as consumers is going to put uh, a, a different uh, stress on the system than we were thinking about 20, 30 years ago. Uh, and the system's going to have to adapt to be able to meet those demands. I think the consumers are now, you know, we thought two or, or three-day delivery was, was a push 10 years ago. Now we have four to six-hour delivery windows. Uh, if consumers are going to expect that kind of responsiveness, the system's going to have to adapt, and there's going to have to be some expansion and, and innovation within the system to be able to accommodate that. Thank you. Yield back. Chairman DeFazio for five minutes. Uh, thanks, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Mathers, uh, you point out uh, that you know, we're using 43% of the capacity of our freight trucks. You give some examples. You had examples of Ocean Spray uh, and, uh, you know, the Colgate, Kimberly, Clark, and Walmart. What, what federal policies could we adopt to uh, encourage higher utilization so we don't have part full trucks running everywhere? That's a, a th thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. It's a, a great question. I, mean, I think that, you know, as we've seen, there's a lot of, um, you know, just operational choices that the, the shippers themselves uh, ha have to make. So um, it's less clear to me exactly on, on, uh, on federal policy choices. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I would think that, um, you, know, you know, part of this is, is kind of information and data sharing between companies. I think we see a great opportunity between shippers to, you know, co-load and collaborate um, in their shipping. And that was the, the example in the, um, in the testimony of, of Colgate and, um, and Kimberly Clark, right? You know, where they're taking trucks off the road, they're delivering more products uh, to, CV, to CVS, you know, uh, inventory costs are going down. Um, you know, I think the big barrier there is, um, is, is, is data and transparency and companies working together. And so I think, you know, it could be uh, um, an, an effort to, to, you know, to study that issue, to bring shippers together and really, um, you know, try to, try to understand how they can get better data transparency among shippers. Okay. I'm still, still thinking about what the federal policies would be, but I, I agree with the transparency and the, and the data sharing, but we've got to figure out ways to uh, incent that or encourage that. Um, Mr. Jeffries, um, as you know, uh, a couple of decades ago, uh, Congress gave Amtrak uh, trains uh, preference over freight, uh, and uh, DOJ can enforce that preference. They've only done it once. And under PREA, Congress uh, directed the FRA and Amtrak to develop minimum performance standards, and then, of course, the freight industry sued. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, now our delays in on-time performance are up dramatically. I just was recently meeting with uh, Richard Anderson, and, you know, I live 112 miles from Portland. Uh, I'd rather not drive on Interstate 5, but their scheduled time <laughs> is, uh, is three and a half hours for 112 miles, and they frequently don't meet that. Uh, we now have freights that are running three miles long. They don't have three mile long uh, sidings. So um, what, uh, how do you recommend that we might better uh, deal with this issue? Because I'm pretty much getting to the point of some pretty strong legislation. So do you have any suggestions short of that? So I think we're, we're happy to see FRA moving forward with the rule. And, you know, they estimated at a hearing in the Senate Commerce Committee, they expect to have that out, you know, next June, I believe. Um, we think they're taking the right approach by taking information from all stakeholders moving forward. I think on the dashboard. Was that has, the FRA? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, we had Mr. Pretori here. He's one of the most embarrassing witnesses we ever had, uh, oh, to tell the truth. So I, I, I'm putting a, not putting a lot of stock in his rule, but we'll, we'll, we'll see how that works out. But uh, you've got to do something here, or we're going to have to do something in the surface bill that's probably not going to like, and it's going to be very prescriptive. So I just well, we think it's to important that. FRA move forward with the rule to get metrics yeah, and standards done. Message across. Um, this is good child. You, you point out a whole host of issues, but I, you're, I guess you're an academic. It's kind of short this on solutions at this point, particularly the urban congestion and the last mile delivery stuff. Well, I think that the industry is is experimenting. I think if you look at the example was raised of, of e-bikes in, in New York City, I'm encouraged by the, the motivation to try new solutions. And those need to be tried before we can identify them as, as well-established solutions. So I think there's a need for experimentation. Uh, we can start with ideas. There are lots of ideas, but it's important to move from ideas to evaluation and consensus and, and establishing those as, as things we might want to set forth as solutions that, that communities should consider. So I think, you know, experimentation and test and supporting that to the extent possible, allowing that to the extent possible is important right now. And part of that also comes from uh, having data and information, investing in, in, in data that we can use to actually evaluate and compare and contrast. Um, also to the point about sort of trucks not being particularly well utilized, there's a very strong market incentive for trucking companies to utilize their equipment. They're very good at that. And the reason they don't is that they're responding to customer demands. And so I think allowing um, you know, considering the, the motivation and the role of the private carrier, listening to what would help them uh, run a more efficient system is, is important. So we have zero visibility about parking availability. If you run a, a tour in the city of Seattle and your goal is to do that quickly and efficiently, Lee, you have no idea what parking will be available uh, at what time, and that's essential to you being, to, to having good performance. So investing in technology that allows us to see what infrastructure is available and to measure its performance will result in benefits in supply chain efficiency. Okay, that's interesting. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Gibbs. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I think the first start, I'll say the good news is the economy is really strong, so that gives us more stuff to move. Consumers are, are buying a lot of stuff. They're driving this economy. And plus, I just said earlier, uh, the consumer dem uh, demands, attitudes are changing, more challenges for all of us in the transportation sector, right? Um, just uh, want to say also, we need all modes. I think we all agree to that. One mode breaks down or stumbles, it's going to affect all the other modes. So we always uh, should be conscious of that we, you know, keep that in mind. And I know we don't have any representation here, I guess, from the trucking industry, but hopefully we can in the future. Um, I know we've met with the auto manufacturers, and on the passenger side, they're, they're pretty much saying they're going to be all electric at some point on, on passenger vehicles, all electric. Now, Mr. Uh, Mathers, I see in your testimony on the trucks, you're talking about uh, heavy trucks, all electric. I just got a few questions on that. On your charts here, um, you got urban delivery, regional haul. There's not long haul on there. So the first comes to my mind is um, horsepower. 
uh, is the technology there? Where we are the technology for the horsepower and also the cost um, for you know industry to, to, to uh, drive, driving this, and then take that a bit further because I, I I think uh, you know we've we've reduced our greenhouse gas emissions in this country in the last decade about 13 to 15 percent reports I've seen, and that's from natural gas. I think most people agree to that. Um, if we have an all electric passenger fleet and we move to an all-electric freight fleet, what, has anybody studied what, what, what's that do to our demands on our grid, our gener electric generation, and, and the overall emission, em emissions overall? So I guess my question is, uh, most of to Mr. Mathers, I think, do you know what the costs are to make these heavy-duty trucks electric and their operating costs, how that compares to a, a CNG or an LNG vehicle? And then also how it how it relates back to the all the way from the start of generation to, to, to the all the yeah, way through. Great. Well, thank you, thank you, Mr. Gibbs. Uh, you know, I, I think that uh, maybe the, the the first thing to talk about um, around is is the horsepower, right? You were you were asking about. Um, you know, uh, right now, you know, Daimler has, I believe it's twenty uh, E Cascadias, pulling uh, cargo out of L. A. Long Beach. Um, you know. The, the horsepower is there, and uh, uh, and the technology is is working for you know drayage applications and um, you know kind of making inroads into regional hall, which are you know um, you know 150 200 mile kind of duty cycles, right? Uh, and I think that's what we're what we're looking for when we think about zero emission um, class eight trucks is you know having that day cab operation going from a um, grocery store, uh, distribution center or grocery store, right? Um, and, and then, you know, for the long haul, right, I think the question is how do you get, um, how do you use that capacity in the long haul to the fullest? How do you use intermodal? Um, and I actually think there's a great pairing between using intermodal to move freight for the long haul and uh, using zero emission to, to deliver for the freight regionally. Um, on the cost question, I think just yesterday, um, Bloomberg New Energy Finance came out with their uh, annual up, uh, update of uh, the cost of um, uh, EV battery packs. And uh, it was $156 per kilowatt hour. Uh, that is down from $11,000 per kilowatt hour in, um, uh, in 2010, right? We are seeing a dramatic reduction in um, how about uh, cost? Of, how about cost of the heavy-duty trucks, electric? The, the, the trucks, yeah. So like the the um, the trucks on the there's I just, there's possibly a data right now on the trucks themselves because the trucks in operation right now are um, uh, largely demonstration projects, right? Where you have vehicle, electric heavy-duty vehicles uh, is in the transit space, right? And right now, you know, uh, the electric. Uh, transit buses cost more up front, but they um, deliver savings over the life cycle I'm, I'm costs. Gonna, I'm running out of time. Your organization, Environmental Des Defense Fund, are you pro or con, uh, you know, uh, integrating it more natural gas where it, where it makes sense and to move this or? It's, it's a great, great question. So um, I think I'll make, I'll make two really quick points on that. Um, one is um, that uh, electric power is inherently more efficient. So if you want to take natural gas and get uh, miles out of it, uh, you'll get twice the miles by, by making electricity and putting that electricity into a battery and using that to move the vehicle. Second point is freight has two sources of emissions, criteria emissions that harm local air pollution and global climate emissions. Natural gas can help with one. It hurts with global climate emissions because of uh, the serious issue of methane leaks throughout the supply chain. I'm out of time, so I have to yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. <clears throat> Ms. Napolitano. Thank you, Ms. Madam Chair. Ms. Aleman, you've discussed economic uh, importance of freight investments. You also represent local communities throughout which freight moves, much like the Alameda Corridor in my district. Would you discuss the community impacts of freight movement, of the quality of life impacts and concerns and what projects are best at addressing these issues, and should the freight industry be more invested in addressing local impacts of rail? Thank you for the question, Congresswoman. 
You know, we estimate the motorist delay in the Chicago region costs about $58 million in 2018, but we're re-examining that research to really look at what the local impacts are of congestion on communities across our region. We have 284 municipalities and seven communities that I represent here as the MPO. You know, and we are seeing that perhaps the number, just based on our preliminary research that, that and the data we're collecting, that perhaps the number of congestion is even worse in our communities. And you know, to local communities, the, the impacts of congestion are real, air quality impacts are real, the deterioration of their local roads, um, the safety impacts and the noise impacts. These are, these are things that communities are grappling with. So as, as a planning organization, we are working with communities to help them address these projects, these, these co concerns proactively. We're doing local plans, we're helping them build their capacity at the local level, and really trying to get ahead of freight movement and freight demand increases by helping them figure out where trucks should be, you know, and what time of day those trucks should be in different places. So. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Uh, Mr. Mathers, I represent part of Southern California, which is home to the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. 45% of the nation's imports and exports go through it. Our ports have done a remarkable job in the past 10 years at continuously greening their drayage trucking fleets. One problem with the retrofits is that their costly upgrades are get passed on to the truck drivers themselves. This is a further problem to where many corrupt trucking agencies force employees to lease own trucking models and then severely underpaid drivers and force them into bankrupts to pay to trying to pay for engines. How do we deal with this problem? Hey, um, thank you for, for the for the question. I, I, I think um, you know the drage space is um, you know I think a, a complex and challenging space and I think for you know as we're thinking about zero emission uh, uh, opportunities there. I think the big challenge is just the, the connect between um, the the cost of the technology and the availability of capital for the uh, for the drivers themselves. Um, and so I think you know uh, uh, you know one of the things I'm, I'm noting here is is uh, hoping that you know that this committee moves forward and brings stakeholders together to create a plan for you know moving that industry to. Um, you know, 100% zero emission drayage trucks by 2030. Um, and a key part of that is gonna be, you know, financing mechanisms for the drivers and, uh, you know, understanding the roles that, um, that the shippers should be paying and that other folks, um, you know, other stakeholders have to make sure that uh, drayage drivers can, can move into zero emission vehicles. Thank you very much. Ms. Aleman and Mr. Taiman, uh, the uh, FASTAC created two freight funding programs one at 4.5 competitive grant and the other at 6.3 formula for the states. We're all concerned that competitive freight has been overly politicized and meritorious projects are not being awarded. Should transportation bid put all the freight funding into the former formula national highway freight program so that each state is given freight equity? I, I want to be sure that I understood your, your question, Congresswoman, was about the, the equity of the distribution of the funds in the program. Should we yeah. move all the funds into the uh, National Highway Freight Program instead of having the other competitive by the administration? Mm. So I think both programs are necessary. I mean, one of the things that, that I saw when I was at the DOT is that you know freight impacts across the state are very different than the, the freight programs where folks would come together across jurisdictional borders to um, work on those those highly complex projects. And th those competitive funds were really a, an incentive for communities, for multi-states to be able to work together. And then at the local level to the, the distribution of those funds to the states um, were helpful in them addressing sort of the interstate um, commerce challenges. Just a Tyson. Timon. Oh, Tyler, may, I, may I weigh in on that as well? I think that that's, uh, you bring up a great point, and I do think that there's a role for both discretionary and formula programs, but uh, the fact that uh, there is such uh, variation from Congress to Congress or administration to administration in how those discretionary dollars are distributed, I think really adds more merit to the formula-based program because it's a predictable stream of funding that will allow project sponsors such as states to be able to pick the projects that they need to do over a long period of time. Uh, so I just think that what you've highlighted there is a great uh, supporting statement for formula dollars and the value for them. I think you're right, and I think we should move them. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, 
Okay, thank you, Mr. Napolitano. We move on to Mr. Stauber. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Norton and Ranking Member Pence. Before I go into questioning, I think it's important to illustrate the freight networks in my district of Minnesota and how they interact with each other. In northeastern Minnesota, we have a freight rail lines that carry taconite from the Iron Range to the port of Duluth to be shipped by Lakers across the Great Lakes through the Sioux Locks and to be made into American steel. We have freight lines that transport coal and ag products from the upper Midwest to the port of Duluth to be shipped to the East Coast and across the Atlantic Ocean. The port of Duluth, the most inland port in the nation, accepts intermodal traffic from trucks that must navigate through a treacherous traffic interchange to drop off or pick up their products. Our entire freight network in northeastern Minnesota is interconnected and codependent on each other. This means that if and when parts of the network fail or are inefficient, the entire system suffers. Mr. Baker, can you please speak to the importance of the 45G tax credit, which I support, by the way, to the interconnectedness of freight networks? Thank you very much for the question. Um, Normally people ask me to stop talking about 45G because I do it so frequently, but I appreciate you asking. Uh, it, it's, it's the most critical uh, policy that we have identified to help with short line railroads. We are a largely privately funded network, but given the nature of short line railroads preserving service into small towns in rural America, Congress has long seen the wisdom in, in helping out a little bit. Uh, the, the credit has been expired since the end of 2017. It's uh, sort of beyond, um, beyond critical and crucial for us at this point. Um, it's an extraordinarily effective way to, to, get, um, to get upgrades done in small railroads. Remain competitive? To remain competitive, and those small railroads can do uh, an awful lot with just a little bit of help. Thank you very much. Mr. Tymon, as I mentioned before, the Twin Ports Interchain, Interchange Project, or uh, also known as the Can of Worms. So this tells you a little bit about the nature of this traffic issue just coming out of the Port of Duluth and in the city of Duluth. It is a major inefficiency and danger in the freight network in my district uh, around the port. Can you please uh, speak a little bit about how uh, the highways and specifically the interchanges such as uh, the can of worms in Duluth, Minnesota can impact freight travel and how important it is to ensure their efficiencies to maximize our shipping capabilities? Thank you for that question. Uh, you know, I think first you mentioned safety and safety is, is the number one priority for every state DOT across the country. So in addition to making sure that uh, we can move that freight as efficiently as possible. We need to make sure that the system operates as safely as possible. So, uh, you know, I think that the project that you've described, uh, there's probably a project like that in every state across the country, whether it's called the spaghetti bowl or the zoo or uh, the can of worms. I can't say I've heard that one before. Uh, you know, there, there's, there are strategies that states can, can do to work with localities to make sure that they uh, either uh, look for ways to operate that facility as efficiently as possible, whether it's use of technology or, uh, in some cases, you know, looking at that facility and seeing uh, if there are changes that need to be made from a, an infrastructure standpoint to help it operate uh, efficiently. I think that uh, part of the biggest problem there are, is funding. Uh, and if there isn't the resources that are necessary for a state or a locality to take on a major project like that, if you're talking about re- uh, constituting that interchange in a way that looks significantly different than what it does now, you're going to need a significant amount of dollars to be able to do that. Uh, so having a robust federal program that will be able to fund those types of projects would be extremely helpful in, in having a state be able to tackle something like that. So um, would you say that in our case, if the can of worms, uh, and they're working on it, if that was fixed, be, it was safer and more efficient, what would be the timetable? That the uh, that the econ you would see an economic uh, increase would it be immediate or over a period of time in your experience? Well, I think you'd see both immediate impacts as well as long-term impacts for a, a major project like that. You'll, you'd see probably an immediate impact from a congestion standpoint and from a safety standpoint. But then uh, you're making that area more economically competitive if you're able to increase throughput and increase the reliability and efficiency of that facility. 
Thank you for your questioning and to all the witnesses, thanks for your, your testimony, it's greatly appreciated. I, uh, Madam Chair, I yield back. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr. Stauber. Next would be Mr. Malinowski. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Jeffries, uh, you and I had a Amen. exchange the last time I was here that I wanted to uh, follow up with you on, and, and I wanna say, say at the outset that um, I uh, very, very clearly understand the essential role that freight railways, railways play uh, in our economy um, and the profoundly beneficial role that they play in helping us maintain a transportation system while um, keeping the environment uh, clean and, and, and dealing with climate change. It's un, undeniable. Um, I do have concerns about safety, though. Uh, and in, in, in our last exchange, you, uh, you placed a great emphasis on data, on basing decisions on data, which, of course, I agree with. And you came uh, today with data about um, falling accident rates uh, in the freight rail system. And it was interesting to me that you chose a time frame going back to the year 2000, which is quite a long time. Um, well, we actually have data that came out, I think even today, uh, on 2019 that allows us to look, I think, at a more significant time period given changes in the freight rail industry just the last few years. So let me read you some data. Since 2016, from 2016 to 2019, total fatalities are up from 519 to 617, almost 16% increase. Um, pass, uh, trespasser deaths uh, up by over 25%. Uh, the rate of train accidents per million freight train miles um, up by around 9% since 2016. Um, hazmat cars damaged or derailed up by over 20% since 2016. Um, since you are so focused on data, um, I wonder if you could offer us an explanation as to why things have gotten so much worse in just the last three years. So first, thank you for that. Um, let's, let's, start with, uh, let's start with the deaths. Um, you know, you mentioned trespassers, um, grade crossings. I don't, I don't know if you mentioned grade crossings specifically, but that's an area of challenge, absolutely. 96% of rail fatalities are at grade crossings or trespassers, and um, that's an area where we, we continue to focus on, on driving that number down, and it's certainly a, a, a responsibility. It's a shared responsibility with the railroads, with the communities, with uh, individuals involved, um, and it's something that we'll, we need to continue to work on, and absolutely we'll do that. Um, that number is, is dramatically lower than it was historically, but it's not low enough because it's still above zero. So we have more work to do. Well, it's Absolutely. not just that these numbers are above zero. Of course, we always want to get down to zero. Right. It's that they've been going up. Well, I think really every year we want to drive board, them not, down. Not just, well, since 2016, virtually every safety-related statistics looks, looks worse and worse. Well, the freight rail industry. And, and you know, you, you were touting this miraculous technology Locomotives are supercomputers on wheels, identifying all these problems Absolutely. before they arise, and yet things are getting worse. And I, and I, well, stress I, I would this challenge because they're getting worse. I, I'm not looking at the same data I'm looking, you are, but I'm happy to share this. Um, this is from the FRA. You know, when we look at hazmat category. transportation, we're in the safest era ever. 99.998 of hazmat movements moved from point to destination without any incident whatsoever. Compared to the that's early not 20th century, perhaps, but in the last few years, that's actually is current data, but. And look, I'm stressing this because you're up here advocating for certain right. things. You're advocating that we do nothing on the length of freight trains, that we do nothing on uh, crew requirements for freight trains. You're advocating that we allow increasingly hazardous materials like LNG to move on freight trains. Um, you, you said something earlier today, it was a really eloquent statement in, in its way. You said, let's not focus on prescriptive ways to get there. What do you mean by that? Are you suggesting we do nothing? No, I'm saying let's talk about the goal we want to get to and let's set benchmarks for, for getting to that goal, but let's not set one way and one way only for how to get there. So basically no way. You, you, want, you, you want us to basically tell you uh, have safer railways but allow the industry to figure out how we do it. I, I no think regulation. that when you prescribe one and only one way to get to a, a 
desired outcome, you miss opportunities. I think we have a shared interest. I mean, this conversation shows we have a shared interest in maximizing safety. And so we can agree on that. Um, like I said, we, we may disagree on data interpretation, but I think we can agree on shared shared goals of, of safety. So something I'm certainly happy to have more conversations with to see where Sir, we can you know, A couple weeks ago, the CEO of Boeing was sitting right in that chair. Mm -hmm. And right over there, we had families of people who lost their lives because the airline industry lobbied us for 20 years for less and less regulation, and he had to look them in the eye and apologize. I, I really hope that you don't find yourself in that position at some point in the future. There has to be a prescriptive way to get there, and we have to work together to find it. Thank you. I yield back. Uh, Mr. LaMalfa. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Mathers, um, EDF is known for its attempt to use market-based policies it claims on taxing or increasing costs, fines, whatever, on things that doesn't favor, while decreasing costs on environmentally friendly vehicles or other, other um, energy-consuming means. So do you support the repeal for heavy-duty trucks we're talking about? A federal excise tax has been around since World War I. I'm carrying a bill on this that adds the cost of uh, heavy-duty trucks, $10,000, $12,000, $15,000 as a means of getting more cleaner, more environmentally friendly, cleaner running diesel engines onto our roads? Uh, th thank you for the question, Congressman. Um, I think it'd be great to, um, to uh, target that tax break for zero emission vehicles, right? zero emission trucks, and that, that the um, uh, focus should be on um, incentivizing a move to the you know uh, the cleanest technology we have available. The diesel engines produced these days are much cleaner than the ones that are ten years old or more. Uh, and yet, um, they there there's still significant room for improvement, uh, particularly in the um, uh, you know low speed, high idle um, duty cycles. Um, and uh, and that's why um, you know the the EPA um, in and the California Air Resources Board are currently both working. Um, on, uh, on regulations to uh, further reduce NOx emissions. Um, and, and we're happy to see that, and it's desperately, it's desperately needed. Well, there's a time period between now and when this technology becomes available, whether you're talking all electric vehicles or lower NOx or what have you, that people still need to buy and purchase trucks sure. and uh, utilize, upgrade the fleet. California, we see CARB coming down on people right now by January 1 many trucks are gonna be unavailable to folks, so they gotta replace them with something. So shouldn't they replace them with the best available technology today? Or do you want to just make them uh, have nothing until then? You know, so there are, you know, I think that um, there are programs that exist, such as the Diesel Emissions Reduction Act, um, you know, through the EPA that, um, you know, help get dirty diesel trucks off the road, and we fully support that. Uh, and I think there's, there's lots of opportunities. I think the question is, um, you know, where should, um, you know, where should we target taxpayer money? Uh, and I think that is to, uh, to, you know, move forward with really You, you um, made a good point there. Technology. This is taxpayer money. These truckers are paying these additional taxes on a vehicle they're trying to replace older vehicles with that are achieving 99% cleaner emissions than one that's 10 or 15 years old. So it is indeed their money. So why aren't they allowed to keep more of their money so they can replace a truck sooner? Well, I mean, I, again, I think it's it's it'd be great. It's great to incentivize the um, uh, you know advanced technology uh, such as zero emission t uh, zero emission trucks. We're not uh, talking zero emission. We're talking extremely low emission available trucks right now. Mm -hmm. Mr. Lamafa, uh, do you mind if I weigh in Jump on in. this? Uh, Quickly, please. I, I think you're referring to the federal excise tax on. Uh, are, are you referring to the federal excise tax on the purchase of new trucks and trailers? Yes, sir. Uh, I see the, absolutely the merits of your argument in saying that if you eliminate that tax, that there is less of a barrier for trucking companies to purchase new equipment. I would say that is a great argument there. I think the concern for a lot of us in the transportation community is the loss of revenue associated with that tax. Uh, so I don't think that a lot of folks in the transportation community are opposed to the elimination of it. It's the fact that it would leave a pretty large gaping hole in highway trust fund revenue. Uh, it's a for pretty small a, percentage of the overall highway trust fund, but it is a big barrier for somebody 
especially owner operators trying to replace a truck. Absolutely. It's and only several billion dollars of a giant fund. Uh, so it, you would rather keep that in place to keep a barrier for uh, small operators, especially to buy these trucks? No, I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that we need to be cognizant of making sure that whatever hole that leaves, that it's replaced by some other revenue source. We're already spending about $15 billion a year more from the Highway Trust Fund than we're bringing in in revenue. Uh, so a change like that, if that increases that delta, uh, which I'm not saying that, that folks are opposed to, I just think that that revenue needs to be replaced in some way, shape, or form. There's a lot of ways to replace revenue, but uh, certainly sacking the small, or any of these folks. If you, if you all won't talk about wanting to have cleaner running trucks on the road immediately, especially with CARB coming down on California truckers on January 1, just days away from now, and you make it uh, a much higher bar by having this World War I air attack still in place, then you're not achieving cleaner air. You don't have the electric vehicles that um, are uh, available in any kind of volume these days, or even seen as uh, as viable, you know, maybe in short hauls, short short term use, and things like that. But over the road trucks still need to have available the current technology that's improved to 99% cleanliness, and that's what nobody acknowledges around here, mm -hmm. is that they've achieved much much cleaner tailpipe. Whether we're talking trucks or cars, and still we go down this path where people are going to have much fewer choices. Instead, you have the club of government saying, you have to use this kind of vehicle, and that's not gonna work for a lot of folks. The gentleman's time back. has expired. Uh, Ms. Finkenauer. Thank you, Chairwoman. I appreciate you all being here today, too, and taking all of your time to, to come and testify. This is an important topic, and uh, my first question happens to be for Mr. Jeffries. Uh, in your testimony, I know you mentioned how the ongoing trade war with China is hurting two industries that are heavily served by railroads, both agriculture and manufacturing, uh, which we feel uh, pretty strongly in Iowa one right now. Uh, as a result, the demand for rail service has gone down. Um, I heard this firsthand when I was visiting Iowa Northern Railroad in August, one of our short line railroads in Iowa, and learned about the problems of the trade war has created very specifically for their business. Uh, with Brazil now having taken over uh, most of our market share of soybean imports to China, uh, the, railway, the railway is moving less grain and facing more competition from larger rail, 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 railways for shipments to local processors. John Deere, one of their customers, um, a large employer in my district, uh, has seen their sales drop because of this ongoing trade war with China um, when our farmers are not doing well they are not buying new machinery, and uh, meaning that Iowa Northern Railroad is moving less of their freight. Mr. Jeffries, how are railroads responding to the reduced demand for freight services? Thank you, Congresswoman. You know, you hit the nail on the head just about trade uncertainty in general, whether it's China, whether it's, it's north-south trade uncertainty right now with, with um, the, the USMCA. Um, but very specifically, China right now, absolutely. specifically when it comes to steel, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to grain exports. agriculture products, um, it is devastating our state right now. Absolutely, yeah. and you know when when your when your customers and your farmers are aren't moving stuff, the railroads aren't moving stuff. So it's a it's a chain reaction, and you know we we feel strongly and have advocated that you know we need to we need to address the the tariff situation with China, and we need a a, a positive outcome. No one says there aren't issues that need to be yeah. dealt with, um, but that uncertainty is having a dramatic effect. You know we 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 went from from exporting colossal amounts of grain out through the Pacific Northwest to virtually nothing now. And like you said, other markets are, are moving in um, to substitute U.S. US grain uh, shippers. Yeah. Um, and it's incumbent upon us to, to get a deal in place to, to allow those shippers to thrive again. And, and railroads are, are there. You know, I think 42% of our overarching traffic is direct import-export related. So yeah. um, it's grain, it's, it's, it's all products, it's intermodal. So we, well, we're with and, you on that. Thank you. And Mr. Baker, I know uh, specifically for our short lines, one of the things, again, that I heard, you know, they are 
struggling right now because uh, the bigger uh, uh, competitors are coming in to markets that they typically aren't in because uh, of, of lacking you know, uh, their own markets right now that they would typically have. And uh, it's been harder and harder and harder for them to be able to continue to compete. Are you seeing this in other areas in the country? I know, again, in Iowa, it's we're getting hit on all sides of it, whether it's the ongoing trade war with China or whether it's the refinery waivers that we saw that have hurt our corn growers or so ethanol plants that are struggling right now as well. Um, it's just, again, getting hit on all sides. But are you seeing this through the rest of the country as well? No question. The huge percentage of the U.S. economy and, and then, of course, a huge percentage of rail business uh, is dependent on trade, China, Canada, Mexico, all over the globe. Uh, just to put as simply as possible, we believe in free and fair trade. We desperately need uh, Congress and the administration to get to a resolution on the China tariffs problem and USMCA. Um, and if, if you wouldn't mind me riffing for 10 seconds on my other favorite topic, the 45G tax credit, I, I, I have to bring it up only because I know that you've been extremely vocal on the biodiesel tax credit, which would be part of the same tax extenders package. So I just wanted to thank you for your leadership on that uh, for Iowa, for the whole country, and you're doing the Lord's work. So thank you. <laughs> no, it's, it's important for the future of my state, which is my home, and I care a lot about it. And I'm really concerned as this trade work continues continues uh, about how this is going to impact our short line railroads in particular um, about making those investments that they typically do. I mean, I, I, I understand that short lines invest an average of 25 to 33 percent of their revenue into their infrastructure. And uh, this is something that, again, is hitting my state on all sides. And I continue to just listen to folks and make sure that I hope uh, the administration is hearing us as well. So thank you for being here and uplifting uh, the need to get a resolution sooner than later and not after the 2020 election when it comes to China. So thank you. Uh, Mr. Babin. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you witnesses for being here. We really appreciate all this valuable information. Uh, my question is for Mr. Timon. Uh, as this uh, committee prepares for the reauthorization of the FAST Act, the growing use of technology throughout the entire transportation sector will be a, a huge role, will play a huge role in our deliberations and our considerations. What are the most critical issues that this committee should be focusing on at the federal level when it comes to the use of technology? And how can Congress be helpful rather than getting in the way of innovation in private industry? Thank you for that question, uh, Congressman. I, I think uh, you've highlighted really uh, the crux of my answer, which would be to get out of the way uh, as Absolutely. much as possible. And, and let states be uh, those incubators for innovation that they always have. Uh, you're seeing more and more states incorporate technology into their transportation solutions. Uh, again, I think the, the issue of the day is the 5.9 gigahertz spectrum and making sure that that stays reserved for transportation safety. Uh, I appreciate that several members of this committee have come out extremely strong uh, in pushing back against the FCC uh, to make sure that the, the FCC knows that state DOTs and, and transportation stakeholders in general want to see the 5.9 gigahertz spectrum reserved for transportation safety. Right. Uh, I think that is, uh, as I said before, safety is our number one priority. Uh, our goal is to get to zero highway fatalities. The only way we're able to get to zero highway fatalities is to incorporate more and more technology into our transportation network. Uh, a key part of that is utilization of the 5.9 gigahertz spectrum. Yes, sir. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, also, I represent nine counties, uh, Texas counties, that is, uh, from Houston over to the Louisiana line, and I incl that includes the port of Houston. As you know, the entire nation depends on the efficient movement of freight and goods out of uh, southeast Texas, which is a, a huge center for, for transportation and, and lots of modes of transportation. Uh, could you share uh, with this committee what technological innovations uh, state DOTs, you mentioned that a little bit in the, in the previous answer, but uh, maybe a little more specifically, uh, and what these state DOTs are, are utilizing to address the increasing movement of goods across the country, across towns, and in our neighborhoods. 
And if there's any time left, I'd like to ask someone else to. Sure. So I'll, I'll, be, I'll be quick in, in saying that, uh, you know, it really varies from state to state. But one area that I think you're seeing states utilize uh, more often is data. They're analyzing the data that they have to be able to better target the limited amount of dollars that they have to invest in infrastructure. I would say that's absolutely true on the freight side as well. You're able now to be able to take the data on where freight is moving from point A to point B, right. be able to look at it on a map, and be able to tell which facilities need improvement. And I think that the utilization of data and how states DOTs are being able to analyze that and then target investments based on that data uh, is really having an impact on how we move freight and people, and I think that's only going to improve uh, as we move forward in the future. Absolutely. Thank, thank you so much. And uh, Mr. Jeffries, could you, could you add to that? Yes, yeah, certainly to echo Mr. Tymon's comments, you know, on the freight rail side, whether it's in the port, um, in route um, to, to destination, that, you know, d data is driving visibility into the system. It's allowing for optimization and how things are moved in the port to increase throughput, decrease dwell time, um, increase customer visibility as to where their products are um, in route. Uh, not quite to the level of uh, maybe an Amazon yet, but, but working towards that end goal. Absolutely. And uh, Mr. Baker? The, uh, the use of technology in rail is a is huge, um, huge focus of the owners and operators of the system. I would agree that the data and essentially the freight transparency, the uh, customers knowing where's my stuff, when's it going to get there, when are the empties going to arrive is crucial. And there's also, uh, since the environmental aspect of this has also been a big topic, I'd also add uh, on the locomotive side, tier four locomotives are the are, are uh, sort of the hot new thing in rail rolling stock, and it's a, a massive improvement over previous locomotives, and railroads are implementing them uh, as fast as they can, and some railroads, particularly smaller railroads, do get some, some help from the federal government through programs like uh, DERA, and that's much appreciated and a big way to help uh, reduce emissions. Absolutely, thank, thank you all for that uh, great information. Information is very valuable as we uh, deliberate over this uh, important issue. So I'll yield back. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Babin. Uh, Mr. Stanton. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you to the witnesses, outstanding testimony here today. The movement of freight and goods plays a critical role in our daily lives by providing us the things we need or want, but it is also key to our country's economic future and maintaining our global competitiveness. Growth over the last 20 years Improvements in the manufacturing process and new technology are placing ever greater strain on the capacity to move goods. And this growth is only expected to continue increasing. In fact, the U.S. Department of Transportation estimates by 2040, freight volumes across all modes of transportation will increase by 42 percent. Expanding freight transportation capabilities and working towards creative solutions is something we here in Congress must focus on. In my state of Arizona, the Maricopa Association of Governments has been working on a regional transportation strategy that looks closely at how we prioritize freight-driven investments to ensure goods are transported safely and efficiently. The effort has brought together a number of stakeholders to find ways to expand commerce, strengthen our economy as it relates to freight. Uh, my first uh, questions are for Ms. Ailman. Arizona is a significant link in the national freight network. Large volumes of freight moved by rail from the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach to Chicago through Arizona. In fact, more than 74% of all freight entering Arizona, measured by value, is moving through my state, meaning that many markets outside of Arizona are dependent upon the health of the infrastructure within Arizona. In my district, residents feel the pinch of this nationally significant movement when they are stuck in traffic congestion or at rail crossings. Likewise, I recognize that Chicago's role as a national rail hub means that your residents face many of the same challenges. Can you talk a bit about the need for the federal investment in regions like ours that are critical to our nation's economy? Thank you, Congressman, for the question. You know, freight is a commodity that we need to look at nationally. I think the burden, again, for paying for these nationally significant projects can't be shouldered by the states that, that are dealing with sort of the near-term local impacts because they aren't seeing the benefits. This really is a global marketplace here. And so this is why, from uh, the Kaget perspective, that we 
have been looking at the $12 in unique requests for every $1 of infra available and it would advocate for a $12 billion program um, of competitive funds. Like I said, in the Chicago region, our CREATE program is an example of how that brings stakeholders together who wouldn't otherwise be focused on these issues. As we've discussed before, but it's worth repeating, you've called for removal of the 10% cap on non-highway funding under the freight formula program, as well as a cap under the infra program, uh, grant program. Can you explain why removal of this cap is important, once again, for the national goods movement goals? Absolutely. Our freight across this country doesn't move on our highways alone, and that's really why we need to employ strategies like removing the cap on the multimodal dollars um, given to states, uh, really because we need states to be able to work together to pre address their most pressing freight needs. Thanks so much. In our urban centers, last mile deliveries face regular delays due to traffic congestion. Dr. Goodchild, in your curb allocation change project, you suggest that reforming curb space allocation such as adding drop-off and loading zones could improve things. Could you discuss this a little bit more and what else, uh, could, what else could lessen the economic and environmental impact from urban road congestion caused by freight? Yeah, thank you. So the status quo of how we manage curbs is, is we, we put yellow paint on it or, or white paint and sometimes some red paint. Um, so, and we haven't updated that approach uh, so there's a lot that we could do, use it uh, differently at different times of day, more dynamically allocate that curb and, and price that curb in a more responsive way. Um, we certainly need to do that and many, uh, many cities are interested in doing that at this time, including Seattle. Um, in terms of reducing the impact on communities, there is certainly a, a need to use some low emissions uh, solutions. So e-bikes, some of that is actually very simple. Uh, there's walking deliveries that happen from, you know, we bring five people to a delivery truck and they can walk with hand trucks from there. It's actually a very cost-effective, fast solution in dense urban areas. Um, so using less fuel-intensive modes in that last mile reduces the impact on those communities. All right, thank you for your outstanding answers. I'm just about out of time, so I'll yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Bald Balderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, panel, for being here. And uh, I have a couple questions. Uh, my first question is for Mr. Tymon. Uh, thank you very much for being here today. And uh, in your testimony, you mentioned the need for Congress to increase flexibility, reduce regulatory burdens, and improve project delivery in our service transportation system. AASHTO believes Congress should modernize the Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, and the Endangered Species Act to reduce infrastructure and construction delays. I would like to hear your thoughts on specific ways Congress should change these laws. Can you please provide examples of how these changes would benefit our infrastructure system and help our State Departments of Transportation? Thank you for that question. Um, what I would like to request is that I could provide specific recommendations for the record, but if uh, you allow me the opportunity to provide more of an overview, I, I can say uh, that the changes that we're looking to make to those, uh, those laws are really updating them. Uh, many of them have not been touched in 20 or 30 years, uh, and it's not that we're looking to uh, not continue to safeguard the environment. Far from it. We think that uh, we can make improvements and changes to those laws, but still make sure we're doing right by the environment. Uh, it's the fact that many of them have not been changed at all or, or changed very little in the last 20 or 30 years uh, that we think that it's time for Congress to at least take a look at those laws to see if there are some improvements or modernizations that can be made. Okay, thank you very much. The next question is for Mr. Jeffries. Mr. Jeffries, thank you for being here. In your testimony, um, you note that the operations and capital investment of America's freight railroads support over 1 million jobs, 219 billion in economic output, and 71 billion in wages. Additionally, railroads generated nearly 26 billion in tax revenues in 2017. I know a couple other of my colleagues have mentioned and talked about the, the USMCA, and that's kind of the path that I want to go down, but international trade accounts for about 35% of the US rail revenue. 27% of the U.S. rail tonnage and 42% of the car loads and intermodal units U.S. railroads carry. 
Can you discuss the needs for Congress to ratify the USMCA and what impact the trade agreement would have on the railroad and freight industry and their workers? Thank you, Congressman. That is a fantastic question. Um, you know, I, I cannot reiterate more the, the need to move forward on USMCA. Uh, North-South trade, you know, with the U.S., obviously our, our largest trading partners, and, you know, the amount of goods that, that flow out of the country via rail to both the, the North and the South, from grain, for example, into Mexico is our largest export product. Um, it, it, it's staggering, quite honestly. It's a job creator. It's an ec economic uplifter um, for, for our customers. Um, and not only that, when, when you look at the supply chain that's been built up over the past several decades, it is a, an international supply chain. So on a lot of products, automotive, for example, you'll see uh, parts move back and forth across the border multiple times. So it, it's not something that can just be ripped up and, and airdropped in, uh, uh, in another fashion. So, um, you know, 50,000 rail jobs rely directly on international trade. A lot of those are north-south movements. Again, and so I, I cannot um, state our support for, for getting USMCA done as soon as possible enough. All right, thank you very much. Madam Chair, I yield back my remaining time. Thank you, Pam. Thank the gentleman. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Passing the USMCA uh, will increase trade, but what direct impact will it have on the ability of the nation to? Uh, sustain the need for increased spending uh, to repair and replace our crumbling infrastructure. Well, from the Mr. rail perspective, Jeffries. from the rail perspective, well, anybody, anybody. Can okay, I'll, I'll start, and someone else can take it from me. But uh, from the rail perspective, you know, we're we're making long-term investments year in, year out, because, you know, these are 50-year investments. Uh, certainly, the same can be said in the highway system. So it, it's the certainty that trade deals put in place so you can well, plan yeah, I, and I make those investments. I understand we uh, want to increase trade, and we're projected to do, that, to do that as the years move forward. But my question is, in terms of repairing and creating new infrastructure upon which uh, freight can move, we need federal revenues in place to do that. Is, is, does everybody agree with that? Certainly on the highway side. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you, would, you, would, uh, would anyone disagree with me that it has been federal revenues that have enabled uh, the growth of our transportation network up to this point? Mr. Johnson, absolutely, I agree with you on that. Uh, we need a robust federal program in order to be able to fund uh, our transportation network. Uh, if we are going to make sure that we're providing for interstate commerce, both from a freight standpoint, but also from a uh, passenger standpoint, we need a robust federal program. Right now, the, the program is not meeting the existing state of good repair needs that we have as the crumbling infrastructure reference that, that you had mentioned. Uh, we need something that to be done to fix the Highway Trust Fund, to provide additional revenue, and to increase the size of these programs. Now, you know, we've been cutting revenue, federal revenues, for decades. We have uh, recently uh, cut taxes again. And while we've been cutting taxes for decades, uh, the needs for funding have continued to grow. And at the same time, my friends on the other side of the aisle have signed onto the Grover Norquist new, No New Tax Pledge, which is one reason why the gas tax has not uh, been raised since 1993. What impact does this uh, have on our ability to, uh, to grow our infrastructure to accommodate the increased trade that we all agree that we want the nation to, uh, to experience? What impact are our policies of cutting taxes and failing to raise revenues with increasing needs having on this nation's ability to sustain our prosperity into the future? If I may, Congressman. Um, you know, one of the points that I made was that private sector industries are um, spending approximately $27 billion annually due to the cost of congestion. 
And that's a cost that I don't imagine that they are just taking on um, and not passing on to the consumer. And the consumers in return, you know, could be getting so much more value if we were to put revenues forward to address the congestion problems at the forefront as opposed to seeing those, those fees, those dysfunction taxes being passed along in the back end to consumers. Yeah, so when, when the recent $5.8 trillion tax cut passed, 83% of which went to the top 1%, then that means that in addition to consumers paying higher taxes uh, or paying a greater proportion of the remaining tax burden that is in place, they're also getting hit with increased prices for goods that um, uh, are incurred by the businesses that uh, have to use the infrastructure uh, to, uh, that have to build the infrastructure uh, to move the goods that the consumers pay for. So, so the bottom 99% are catching a, a double whammy in this kind of a situation as our, um, as our multinational our corporate friends are able to escape their fair share of the tax burden. And so as we talk about these subjects, I think we need to look at our policies, uh, the policies that we put into place here in Congress and, and uh, stop avoiding the fact that we need to deal with uh, a revenue shortfall from the federal government. And in order to uh, sustain the kind of um, economic growth that we're going to need for our future. And with that, I'll yield back. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Perry. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank the panel members for their attendance today. Mr. Mathers, in your testimony, you stated zero emissions have, uh, zero emission heavy duty vehicles are increasingly viable. But this statement, in my opinion, is not completely based in reality. If they were economically viable and provide a lower total cost of ownership, as you claim, then the industry wouldn't be embracing them due to the market incentives alone. However, the high cost of current battery technology combined with its limited energy density level makes EV trucks infeasible for long haul operations currently and, in, and an expensive alternative for shorter operation. It's also vital to remind everyone that the phrase zero emission vehicle is a deceptive and misleading labeling practice as it fails to account for the emissions related to energy intensive battery manufacturing processes and the very power generation necessary to recharge the battery. This reality not only limits the net emissions reductions offered by a transition to these vehicles, but it requires significant amounts of the rare earth minerals necessary for the production of the batteries themselves. As you know, China has a stranglehold over the component mineral supply chains and the battery manufacturing industry. Also, China is projected to supply around two thirds of global battery demand in 2020, not coming from America, they come from China. The extremely energy intensive manufacturing process will be powered largely by coal well into the future in China. Today, 70% of China's power is generated at coal fired plants and they will continue to generate over half of the nation's power through 2040, which according to Mark Mills at the Manhattan Institute, who quotes, means that over the lifespan of the batteries themselves, there would be more carbon dioxide emissions associated with the manufacturing of them then would be offset by using those batteries to say, replace the internal combustion engine, end quote. It's important to note that these projections likely underestimate the emissions in question as they were published prior to China's recently announced plans to massively expand coal generated capacity while simultaneously cutting funding for renewables by 40%. The threat posed by Chinese influence over our critical infrastructure has been acknowledged by this very House and this committee as we prohibited, prohibited FTA funding of projects using Chinese rail cars and buses. I was gonna ask you about your justification for the EDF support of the significant threat to our national security uh, just by using the vehicles, but also the significantly higher consumer cost, the net increase in greenhouse 
gas emissions and the, the economic harm that it does to the workers in the United States. But maybe I just ask if the EDF would consider including the emissions that are uh, commensurate with the production of the batteries and everything else that goes into uh, the production and the use of the batteries into their assessment of the economic viability? Maybe that's a better question. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Mr. Perry, for the question. Uh, and we do, right? I'm not familiar with the Manhattan Institute study, but I am very familiar with the work that uh, the U.S. government is sponsoring through Argonne National Labs that's looked at um, the life cycle impact of uh, electrification, right, in, um, in electric vehicles and found that um, electric vehicle, the fuel consumption, right, uh, is still by far the most significant source of emissions. Um, and that the consumption, the creation of the battery is on par with the creation of the vehicle. Um, so it's, you know, I think in the order of about 20% of the life cycle. Um, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but would be more than happy to follow up and, and put those on the record. Um, I think on the, the um, I think the questions around China and the life cycle cost, I think all kind of come together. And the fact that, um, you know, the direction of this industry is clear, right? You're, you're seeing Daimler putting in a billion dollars to build these vehicles. You're seeing Cummins invest half a billion, right? Um, there is, the, these manufacturers are doing this because they see that's where the future is. And right now, uh, you know, China has a head start on us. And so I think we, have, as a country, have uh, a choice to make, right? Do we want to outcompete China and make those vehicles here? And I think we're better off if we do, uh, and that, that's better for the environment, that's better for, for our economy, and that's better for our national security. But, but the point is we're not making them here yet, so the policy that you're advocating for is kind of the carts before the horse as opposed to backwards. And I, I don't necessarily disagree that it would be great if that weren't the case, but that's not the case now. Let, and I would just let, like let, your let, estimates let, let to include some. all yeah. these other, to include all these other things and don't paint such a rosy picture which isn't commensurate with reality. And that's what I'm saying. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Lamb. There we go. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, Ms. Aleman, I'm from, I represent an area outside of uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which um, shares some things in common economically and culturally with the Chicago land area. Um, I'm just curious, your review of the CREATE model since it's been uh, built, it looked to me like you said about 40% of the revenue was uh, federal, and then I guess the 60% comes from the other partners that you've enlisted. So do you think that an area like mine has much to learn from CREATE, how would you describe kind of the, um, the breakthroughs that you've made using that model or the efficiencies that you've gained? Because it, it must not be just more federal funding. There must also be some efficiencies that you've established with that model. Yeah, thank you for the question, Congressman. You know, the CREATE model, while we've seen some su very significant successes in terms of getting a federal match and um, also substantial matches from our, our private sector partners, I think some of the the benefits that we've seen are being able to have a list of projects that we've prioritized and are lining up to move forward at any point that funding opportunities arise. For the projects that have been completed, there are about 70 projects in the entire program, about 35 of which have been completed. Um, we have seen that those projects have come in on time under budget, and I think that that is exemplary of the public-private partnership that we have with our railroad partners and leveraging their expertise on some of these projects where, you know, inherently the, the state side and the federal side and then the private sector are coming together. So that, that's what I would say would be one of the primary benefits. And at the start of it, who was kind of the driver of CREATE in the beginning? Was it more of a, a public project in which you recruited the private partners, or was it the railroads coming to you and asking for it, or vice versa, or how, how did it go? Yeah, I would say that there was a leadership between the city of Chicago and Cook County, where which is the county that the city of Chicago sits in, and, and through that strong partnership, we were able to get on board the state, the railroads, and, and other partners, because it's a mutually beneficial pro program overall. Okay. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Ms. Goodchild, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the 
um, university transportation centers. We, we have one back in Pittsburgh as well at Carnegie Mellon University that's doing some really strong work. Um, how would you evaluate that program so far? Has it worked well at Washington? Are there challenges? Are there things we could do better with it? The University Transportation Center uh, has sponsored uh, uh, a center at the University of Washington uh, for, I think, since the beginning of the program. Um, and in terms of our ability to, to, to train transportation professionals, it is essential. Uh, without that program, we would have, uh, you know, at a at a public university, the rest of our sort of resources have really been been stripped away. Um, and so, to provide students with opportunities to hear additional lectures, to travel to TRB, to participate in any kind of professional development, um, is really supported through that program. So, in in, in terms of developing the next generation of transportation professionals, it's it's essential and we would really be um, at a, at, we wouldn't be able to do that without the program. Um, research wise. So, sorry, just interrupt for, so would you say then that the main benefit you're concentrating on is the teaching benefit to students as opposed to like external work product that it's generating? Right, no, I was gonna speak to, okay. the, to the research outcomes. Um, I think also having you know, really as a source of complementary federal funding. So those grants, you know, if you have a grant from a UTC that has to be matched by uh, some kind of non-federal local money. So I think that structure of matching local, locally driven and locally motivated projects by federal grant money is also a really essential way to develop regional um, with national benefit work. Um, and we don't, there's no other, there's no substitute. We don't have NCFRP program. We um, so it, it's essential as well. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Lamb. Uh, Ms. Miller. Thank you, Chairwoman Norton, and thank you all for being here today. Transportation infrastructure is the lifeline that connects my home state of West Virginia to the rest of the country. Our highways and rail lines are essential for moving products from West Virginia and connecting the country. Our inland waterways also ship over 80 million tons of natural resources every year, and shipping via waterways will continue to play an important role to meeting the growing demand for goods well into the future. I think that shipping should be a central part of these discussions moving forward. West Virginia is a transportation state, and we are proud to work hard to deliver the goods that America and the world needs. We're all gathered here today because we realize the importance of our nation's infrastructure development, and I thank you all for appearing before the subcommittees today to help us make some of these tough decisions. Ms. Ailman, my district of Southern West Virginia was one of the hardest hit by the recession and is still recovering from the war on coal, which caused so many to lose their jobs. With the dramatic growth of long haul freight traffic in the United States, how does the freight industry plan to recruit new drivers to meet this increased demand? I'm gonna to defer to my partner here. Fine. Yeah, and I would love also for Ian to weigh in, but I, I'd say we in the um, in the rail industry, we actually don't are not finding a problem recruiting uh, recruiting conductors and engineers for the trains. It's a well-paying job with railroad retirement benefits, and it's typically pretty attractive. We have lots of infrastructure challenges, but I would say at the moment, finding folks to operate freight trains is not one of our challenges. Uh, j just to, to to add on to that, absolutely, you know, the, the, the freight rail industry is blessed with, you know, folks who are multi-generational and, you know, 45-year veterans. And, and while, while there is no shortage because they are very, very well compensated jobs, um, you know, one area where we are facing challenges, quite honestly, is, is the opioid issue. Um, that continues to challenge us along with every other manufacturing industry as far as uh, we, we have a strict, you know, drug testing program and uh, areas that are, that are most hit by the opioid uh, epidemic, certainly that impacts the, 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 the number of um, possible candidates out there and has certainly diminished the potential job pool in certain situations. So that's an area where you know, we continue to want to work with Congress to, to address. Um, but as far as the, the, I don't know, the trucking side, I don't know if you have any comments there. 
You know, I, I would just say that uh, I think workfor workforce development issues are uh, continue to be a top priority for state DOTs across the country, and that includes, you know, maintenance workers and operators uh, of vehicles. Uh, it is becoming harder and harder, I think, for state DOTs or I'm sure trucking companies to be able to recruit new entrants into the business. Um, you know, I think that there is uh, there are a lot of other opportunities for folks right now with the economy doing so well and the unemployment rate so low. It's hard, I think, to attract people into some of those jobs that are, are really aren't easy jobs. You know, for truck drivers, you're on the road uh, a lot of days out of the year. Um, it's uh, if there are a lot of other choices to make, I can see why it's hard to be competitive in this job market. Well, and my point is, in the coal fields, for those people who have had good paying jobs who are now unemployed, are you doing anything to recruit them? I, I can tell you that from a state DOT standpoint, um, uh, recruitment and, 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 and retention is a top priority. Uh, I can't speak specifically to uh, what's going on in West Virginia, but I, I will tell you that what I hear more from our members is a shortage of workers as opposed to... Um, you know, trying to, uh, or, yeah, a shortage is, 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 a, is the bigger issue. So that could go through some of the community college or career teaching that needs to happen. Mr. Baker, what role do short line and regional railroads play in the connecting parts of rural America with the greater transportation network, and what role can Congress play in making sure that these railroads are not left behind? Thank you. Uh, short lines largely exist as the first mile, last mile of the freight rail network, and particularly in small town and rural America. West Virginia is a huge state for short lines. Uh, my written testimony uh, goes into uh, somewhat excruciating detail on some of the policy recommendations I have, but just in a, in a few seconds here, there are, there are programs that the TNI committee has supported and championed that are key for short lines, the Chrissy Grant Program, uh, the issue that's been referenced here multiple times, the idea of taking off the most multimodal caps on the infra program and the state freight program would be, uh, would be really effective. Our favorite topic, the 45G tax credit would be effective. Um, and, and there's more too, but those, are, those would be great, great places to start. And I think you've been champions of all of those. So thank you. Thank you. I yield back my time. I thank the gentlewoman. Her time has expired. Um, <laughs> Miss, uh, Mr. Lowenthal. Th thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Aleman, uh, you know as well as anyone here that freight movement depends upon a complex, interconnected system of transportation infrastructures, deficiencies in any one link, of the supply chain affect the efficient movement of goods for everyone. And that's why I appreciate in your testimony and that of other witnesses, and you've mentioned it again today, both in written and in oral, that the need to remove barriers like the cap on uh, non-highway projects under the federal freight program. I'm also very appreciative that, especially in your written testimony, you mentioned the coalition support uh, for my proposal to establish a multimodal uh, freight infrastructure trust fund that would help make these critical uh, intermodal improvements. But your testimony also mentions a potential improvement to the national freight uh, strategic plan, including the addition of a comprehensive freight needs analysis. Why is that so important to have a comprehensive freight needs analysis? Thank you for the question, Congressman. A comprehensive look at our national freight infrastructure is really going to help us be more coordinated in Congress's effort to provide oversight and guidance to USDOT. Um, it will also help members of Congress shape future programs and future federal reauthorization bills and make sure that really the goals and objectives that you set forth in the policies are being achieved through a transparent performance-based framework. I want to follow up on that, and while I personally strongly su support the INFRA program and agree with you that a competitive grant program is better positioned to fund large-scale infrastructure projects that improve freight movement, I'm concerned about the lack of transparency in the selection of projects for these funds. Would a freight needs analysis allow Congress 
and stakeholders to better evaluate if the department is directing these funds to the most important and urgent projects? Yeah, so I'll reference the recent GAO report that stated that you know merit-based project selection uh, is necessary and also there is room for improvement in the way that projects are, are selected today. And I think our region has seen that and come a long way. Um, for instance, the competitive freight program that the Illinois DOT put together uh, laid out in a transparent way the goals and objectives and how the measures that they were going to use to evaluate projects um, were going to achieve those goals. And essentially, we created a tool that said to potential applicants, you can fill this tool out yourself and evaluate your project. I think one of the fears is, is that is going to open the door to a floodgate of projects coming through and people gaming the system. What we found instead was that the projects that were submitted were better and more oriented toward the goals of the program and the program dollars. And at, at the regional level too, the programming of our funds, we make those data criteria the scoring, transparent, so that all can see, and while you may not get the project you wanted or the funding you requested, you at least respect the process and you understand where your project could have had room for improvement. Thank you. I want to follow that up, and you may have answered it. Do you have any additional suggestions to increase the transparency in the infra uh, evaluation process? Yeah, sp specifically it's tying those those metrics that you're going to use to the goals and objectives that you're trying to achieve. And then I would say making those, those projects and the scoring uh, uh, publicly available. Again, you know, that in, in and of itself, making that transparent, allowing people to see where their projects fell short is a critical tool to making sure that you're achieving your goals. Thank you. In my minute left, does anyone else want to comment on the transparency, what, how we can improve the INFRA project, Mr. Baker? Well, I, I was largely just going to agree with you the the importance of the increasing the transparency. I'll say we have yes. quite a few short line railroads that partner with state agencies to apply for these grants, and they do find it uh, extraordinarily frustrating how um, how opaque the process is, and and it's difficult to understand what was selected, uh, or what the reasons for the selection were. So I think the transparency would help would help everybody. Thank you. I concur as one who represents the uh, port areas of Long Beach, Lo Los Angeles, that transparency would be great for the uh, process. With that, I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lowenthal. Uh, Mr. Pence. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you all for being here today. I hail from Indiana, which is the crossroads of America. I've always emphasized the necessity of reliable and safe freight and transport options in my home state. I'm a businessman by background, and I came to Congress to address the challenges facing our critical infrastructure. We need to face both the short term and long term and put Hoosiers back in the driving seat as well as all those across the United States. The 29,600 miles of highway and 4,500 miles of rail track in our state contributes to the prosperity of not only Hoosiers, but all Americans. We're a national leader in intrastates, home to the second largest FedEx hub worldwide and have the third most freight railroads with 41 lines, including six short line regional railroads in my district, the 6th District of Indiana. We're also very proud that Cummins Engine Company, headquartered just a mile and a half from my house in Columbus, Indiana, is developing world-class innovative solutions to advance cleaner technology. In October of this year, Cummins unveiled cutting-edge technology that would use hydrogen fuel cell solutions to create a Class 8 heavy-duty truck with zero emissions. With our nation's truck and rail freight transport system accounting for 74% of all movement of goods, it is in the best interest of companies like Cummins to embrace fuel efficient alternatives to be profitable and most importantly, reduce the impact on the environment. The American Transportation Research Institute cites greater congestion as a source of excessive and excessive idling and resulting in higher emissions. 
With companies like Cummins modernizing our vehicles, we should also consider more solutions for reliable freight infrastructure, such as increased rail investment and truck-only lanes or critical commerce corridors. In 2017, truckers alone lost 1.2 billion hours of produ productivity from nationwide congestion. I firmly believe that economic growth in both the trucking and rail industries will lead to greater economic, environmental, and societal impact. Mr. Tymon, in your testimony, you mentioned addressing freight corridors in the next surface transportation bill. I wish more of the industry would join you to highlight the benefit of these corridors or, ev or truck lanes to physically separate cars and trucks in the congested areas. Even though truckers already pay more than any other entity in our nation's highways, the industry is coming to the table with creative ways to affect these projects. At the beginning of November, Indiana broke ground on a similar project called the Heavy Haul Transportation Corridor, which will pull semi-trucks off the highway with new rail connections, providing easier access to state roads and improve multimodal shipping. Solutions like these are not only tackling congestion, but also create a safer and more fuel efficient freight system for Hoosiers. Mr. Tymon, I know Ashto has done studies in the past detailing how truck only corridors can alleviate congestion and promote safety. How would reducing restrictions on state multimodal freight network funding to allow, for example, more miles for railroad coordination and CCCs help propel our economy? Well, thank you for that question, Congressman. Uh, I think the, the easiest and the best way to promote those types of projects I, is- Is your uh, mic on? Uh, it, it is. Is that better? Yes. Uh, I think the easiest and best way to provide uh, opportunities for those types of projects is to continue to provide flexibility to the, to the states uh, and to provide funding to them by the formula programs. Uh, these, uh, these core formula programs that have been the foundation of the Federal Highway Program for over 50 years provide states the predictability to know year in and year out how much money they're going to get. And that will enable them to take on innovative approaches, as you're describing in Indiana. So I think uh, removing some of the red tape and the barriers and providing states the flexibility to be creative and innovative as they are in, in Indiana is the easiest and uh, it's the best thing that we can do to promote those types of projects. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Pence. Ms. Plaskett. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Tymon, I agree with you that the formula is very, very important. And as a member of the territories, we were taken out of the formulas in the late 90s. And so it's our hope to go back in them because we believe that that's the best way for us to plan how we're going to use our infrastructure and, and support. So um, I'm glad to hear you agree that that's a really important thing to do. I've been harassing the chair of our committee um, the last time the territories was on it was the last time a member of the territories was on this committee. So I'm hoping that me being on this committee will get us back in there. Um, but I wanted to go back to something that one of my colleagues, uh, Mr. Lowenthal, was talking with you all about, about transparency and, infra pro and the infra program as an example, and in others, um, some of the other application and programs that DOT has in other agencies. <laughs> we talked about how transparency would be more uh, important and, and support and predictability for those that are applying. Um, do we have, do any of you have any specific examples or the types of guidelines or an additional support that would be helpful to uh, jurisdictions and municipalities and others that are applying for some of these grants? You know, uh, one thing that I, I guess, one thing that I would add is uh, sometimes Having consistency across years would help, I think, the, uh, the applicants, because I think we're seeing year to year that uh, the notice of funding availability will change kind of what they're trying to emphasize. Mm -hmm. And I think that causes uh, project sponsors to then have to kind of retool year to year if they're not uh, selected in, in that one year. So having, I think, some consistency across the years, 
Uh, the great thing about the FAST Act was that for those discretionary programs that were created there, they spelled out, uh, I think, specific criteria that provided at least a little bit of predictability for right. the applicants so that they could uh, come back to the table if they weren't successful in the first year. Uh, I do think that the administration is doing a good job of following up with project sponsors if their application does not go through and then letting them know where the application fell short. But having that level of transparency so that everybody knows uh, which projects have been successful and why they have been successful or unsuccessful, I think would help all project sponsors. I, I know that our, um, the Virgin Islands, along with um, some of our private partners, did have that meeting at DOT. And I'm really grateful that the transportation agents, the department was willing to sit down with them and explain what was needed, where they fell short. Uh, of course, having that on the front end is a better way because then you have to wait another year or so to put in those what's missing so that you can have a better application and, and meet the needs of, of what it is you're trying to grow. Um, does anyone else have anything else that they thought might be helpful in there? Just at a very high level, you know, in a prior life I worked at GAO and I think they've, they've been on record just talking about the need for, for very um, objective articulated criteria that are then evaluated in a, in a fully transparent manner. So hopefully you do get that information on the front end and don't have to wait until it's too late to, to get the feedback right. that, that would be helpful. So, so um, several months ago, I am also the chair of the New Dems Task Force on Infrastructure. And I've had the pleasure of going around the country to some of my colleagues' districts to see what's working, what's not working. And uh, Mr. Colin Allred invited me to Dallas. And I was really excited to see the rail that's going on there um, between Dallas and Houston and the types of goods and services that can be moved in that. Um, Dr. Goodchild, I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, that's a public-private partnership. It's really being driven by the private sector. Uh, what is the role that you believe that the PP, P3s can play in helping to meet freight infrastructure needs throughout the country? Yeah, thank you. I think it's essential that there be... Uh, that the private sector be, you know, uh, consulted and engaged and and participate in um, as we build infrastructure. It, you know, if you if you think about building big infrastructure projects with with this, with no insight as to how it's going to be used or what benefit it might bring or why it might bring that benefit, you can really make uh, huge mistakes and invest a lot of money in projects that don't bring the benefit that you thought they were going to mm -hmm. uh, to the ones who are using it. So I think as we move forward and we, we believe that we're building infrastructure to serve industries, that we must understand those industries and they must be engaged in some of that decision making. So um, I think it's a really important principle, particularly uh, in the freight space, mm -hmm. uh, to, to good decision making and efficient you know, cost-effective use of, of public money. Thank you. And, you know, as the Virgin Islands, although we don't have freight, we recognize that all of our goods are imported and that unless the, the end use, the, those individuals who are manufacturing are doing it at a port city, that all of the goods that are coming to us are coming through freight. So bottlenecks in that system affect those of us who don't necessarily have freight going through our districts. And we all need to be part of the solution in making sure that this is done efficiently and the best can, can get to the end users. So thank you all. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Ms. Plaskett. Uh, are there any further questions from members of the subcommittee? Seeing none, I would like to thank uh, our colleagues, but especially each of our witnesses for your testimony today. It's been very helpful to me. I've listened very carefully to see what might, how your testimony might improve our upcoming bill. Uh, your, I, I found your testimony to be informative and helpful in that regard. I now ask unanimous consent that the record of today's hearing remain open until such time as our witnesses have provided answers to any questions that may be submitted to them in writing, and I invite members who have such questions to do so. I also ask unanimous consent that the record remain open for 15 days for any additional comments and information submitted by members or witnesses to be included in the record of today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered. No other members have anything to add. The subcommittee now stands adjourned. Thank you.